Good morning. Can I welcome members to the fourth meeting of the Education and Culture Committee in 2013? Can I remind members and those in the public gallery to ensure that all electro electronic devices, particularly mobile phones, uh, are switched off at all times? Uh, our item today um, is to take further, ever, further oral evidence on the post-16 Education Scotland Bill. And the focus of today's session is those areas of the bill that are particularly relevant to the further education sector. Um, we'll be here uh, evidence from two panels this morning, but can I first welcome um, Mandy Exley, uh, Principal Edinburgh College, uh, Paul Sherrington, Principal Banff and Buckingham College, uh, Carol Turnbull, Principal Dumfries and Galloway College, and Susan Walls, Principal and Chief Executive of Cardonald College. Uh, good morning to you all. The principals we've invited along uh, represent a range of different colleges, colleges that have already been through a merger, uh, those that are planning to merge, and those that will become a, a regional college, uh, and of course those that may become an assigned college. Uh, there have been many categories. The committee hopes that hearing from these different uh, perspectives will help us to understand better the opportunities and challenges faced uh, by the sector uh, in light of the uh, proposed bill. Uh, we're going to move straight to questions this morning, because uh, we have got uh, a, a lot of areas we want to cover. And I'm going to ask Liz Smith to kick us off. Liz. Good morning. Um, I think there's a very striking uh, degree of evidence within uh, the submissions from the colleges about the fact that you feel that you have done a pretty good job over the last uh, few decades in ensuring that you not only have the highest standards of education on offer, but you've been able to uh, offer a, a very diverse range of students uh, different opportunities and that you've been able uh, to build on a lo lot of the local demands from within your own uh, area and within your own local economies. Therefore, you know, post-16 is in that context of ensuring that we can uh, give the best deal, if you like, to a very wide range of, uh, of learners. I wonder if you could say something about how you feel that the uh, proposed changes to the governance uh, of colleges um, will be able to enhance uh, the ability of the colleges to deliver the best education. Take that, if you don't mind. Uh, I think in terms of governance, it can't be separated from autonomy and accountability. In terms of the post-16 bill, there are two different types of governance in some ways being suggested. One for the regional colleges, and one for those colleges which sit within the multi-college regions and will have a regional strategic body overseeing the coherence within that region. In terms of the regional colleges, their boards will maintain pretty much the same shape, although the bill doesn't identify things like what are the required committees, um, how will they be accountable. In, the term, in terms of the multi-college regions, I think there's still some clarity required in terms of how those assigned college boards will work with the regional strategic boards. I'll speak from my own region's experience in that we have at the moment seven colleges in Glasgow. Uh, hopefully by the 1st of August, we will have three colleges in Glasgow. And we previously had a strategic grouping called the Glasgow Colleges Strategic Partnership, which worked collectively to look at how best to rationalise curriculum, look at things like common policies and procedures and try not to reinvent the wheel. That has transformed now into a much more formal strategic partnership. And one of the things that was discussed by our regional lead, Henry McLeish, and the chairs of the existing seven colleges, along with the principals of the seven colleges, was what would the relationship look like between the regional strategic board and future? and those colleges, because one of the things we're very clear about is that we really do not want an additional layer of bureaucracy. One of the strengths of the incorporated college sector was its ability to respond to local need. And within Glasgow, that local need can be very local, or it can, in fact, be part of the Glasgow metropolitan response. So there is a, an issue for the multi-college regions about exactly how will the regional strategic body work with the assigned college boards. And those assigned college boards, apparently, in terms of the legislation as it stands just now, are very small. My college will have a budget of £41 million, and yet will only have between seven and ten members to actually make sure that it's properly governed and accounted for. So in terms of the quality of the college and also in the finances, I think there's still work to be done. Do you, do you think there's a bit of a disconnect there between the ability to have 
uh, good governance over that new setup and the ability, obviously, to ensure that funding is placed in the right uh, position. I, I think that's one of the things that the regional strategic body will have to grapple with because within the, the bill at the moment, there is the ability for the regional strategic body to transfer assets and staff between colleges. And I think it's about the tension that you will have within what are still incorporated colleges. They're still, you know, within legislation incorporated colleges, but working with the strategic board. And I think there's a tension there, both in terms of their legal positions, but also in terms of governance. And are you concerned that there might be some diminution of autonomy for the, the parts of the college? For those assigned constituent colleges, that is a possibility. Okay. Is anybody? Perspective of a, a single region with a college within a, a single region, um, the ability for us to uh, plan regionally coherently as a regional board in a strategic sense is enhanced. You know, there's a, a real opportunity. We believe we're broadly very much in favour of this direction of travel, and there's a real opportunity to do that. Um, it doesn't uh, carry the same complexities as a multi-college region. Would it, would it be correct to say that, in general terms, uh, on, on the principles of the bill, uh, particularly because of just what you said about the overall strategic um, planning that's so important, uh, is it more to do with the actual detail of the proposals within the bill that you're concerned about? <coughs> Yes, it is, and that's in the context, as Susan's alluded to, of accountability and autonomy. Um, one of the key things um, within the bill context is about the appointment of board members and the appointment of the chair of the board and other board members. Um, it strikes me that there's some very good progress being made within the higher education sector and the university sector with respect to codes of practice, as opposed to things being specifically stipulated within a legislative or bill context. And that's certainly a direction of travel that I think the college sector, in terms of a regional college, um, would be very supportive of. So we uh, totally and utterly see the relevance and the importance of the identification and appointment through ministerial appointment of a chair, a regional lead, whichever way that, that uh, perspective lies. But the actual appointment of a wider board and a wider body, we feel, could be, could be done under the basis of a code rather than necessarily on the basis of, again, ministerial appointment. So my, my final question, if that's right, Convener, just now is that you would prefer to see this done uh, without too, too much of a heavy legislative hand, that you feel some of the, the changes uh, could be made without uh, as much as in, in the post-16 bill uh, just now? Right. Yes, we do. If there's, if there's an appropriate code for us to be following... Um, I, I do not see, we do not see at Edinburgh College what the distinctiveness is when we will be planning on a regionally coherent basis with our partner universities between the way that we may actually operate and the way that they may. Um, just to follow up on that, obviously we've got, um, we're going to have the Scottish Funding Council, we're going to have um, uh, regional sectoral uh, strategic bodies in some areas but not others and we're also going to have regional uh, colleges. Add to that um, skills development Scotland's involvement in, in colleges at the moment. Is there not a danger that the inconsistency this will lead to inconsistencies? Um, the different approaches being taken in different areas. Is there not a danger that this um, will become confusing for for staff and for students? Perhaps if I could could answer that. I mean, certainly with regard to you know the changes that I think colleges have experienced recently in terms of the sources of funding. It has been a real challenge, um, and it was very welcome. For example, the, you know, the, some of the money from the employability fund was, was transferred back to the funding council and reintroduced via a sums model, which, at least, if not perfect, is a model which we currently understand. And I think there is a, an issue around about the, the degree of consistency and some degree of, um, I think, settlement. Just as over the over the next year, as we as we drive through, you know, the positive sides of regionalisation, the, the, those issues that you've alluded to, we avoid. Otherwise, it will get very difficult. It might well impact on student experience. Sorry, if I could just add, I think one of the advantages, um, the real advantages of, uh, of regionalisation, you know, the real opportunity to do things coherently can be undermined by the complexity of different sources of activity and funding coming through. So... Um, as Paul says, you know, it, it, 
if you're going to work on the premise of regions and regionalization, one should recognize the distinctiveness of regions. Otherwise, why have regions? Again, we're back into this concept of what is you know, autonomous and accountable. And, and our belief from an Edinburgh College perspective is that it's entirely possible to be accountable, but actually retain a level of autonomy which reflects appropriately that particular region. So there could be one argument which said it needs to consistently apply across the board, whatever happens, it must happen everywhere. We know that's not the case in the bill anyway. Or we could really reflect appropriately the, the importance and the appropriateness of the region. The funding models, I think, are a different matter. I think the governance and accountability arrangements within regions could well be slightly different as a consequence of what's most relevant and coherent for that region. And, and you, you mentioned it early on. What, what, if you have a regional strategic body and you've assigned colleges within that, if the assigned colleges do not meet the agreements with the regional strategic body, what happens? Do the, do, does, is funding taken away? What, what, do, what, what, what happens then? I think that's an extremely good question because that's one of the questions that we have obviously as a sector asked that it is addressed. Uh, if you look at a, a college within a region, one region, one college, it's quite clear what will happen in that the relationship will be between the funding council and the regional board that will you know, take decisions about in terms of would there be any detriment to funding. You would still have the same thing happening in terms of the regional strategic body, but what happens where you have one college which is working extremely well and is highly productive, and perhaps another college that for whatever reason doesn't reach the same levels of performance? So one of the things that's missing within the legislation as we have seen so far is exactly how will performance be measured? And what we would like to make sure, and this goes back to one of the points Mandy made, is there has to be flexibility in there. In terms of a successful region, that will depend on the economic and skills need of that region. So in some areas, it may well be 16 to 19 year olds. In another, it may well be looking at the proportion of 24 year olds plus that have no qualification. It's about maximizing the potential of Scotland's people, you know, using what is a really fantastic sector. Yeah, 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 just now. Okay, um, Liam MacArthur. Following that up, um, I mean, you talk about the, the flexibility needed um, to, to, to cope with um, uh, the, the, the different circumstances that may arise within a single region. I'm just looking at um, the uh, submission from Edinburgh College, and I think you refer to a, a, a separate issue in relation to this. I think you talk about um, the absence of uh, a uh, reference to a framework for performance measurement, decision-making, review and appeal when seeking to identify a non-performing college and the reasons uh, for such non-performance. I suppose that broadens it out, takes it back into the issue of about um, accountability and, and the independence of, of institutions. I mean, uh, it would be helpful maybe if you could expand on what those concerns are and whether it's shared by other uh, members of the panel. Okay. Um Obviously, work is ongoing uh, with the Funding Council at the moment in terms of the development of outcome agreements. And again, we have the same, um, not the same, we have an analogous situation in the university sector in terms of the way that we are planning to use resources most effectively within that regionally coherent context. But equally, we have measures, high-level measures at the moment with an outcome agreement context around which performance and, more importantly, lack of performance is far less clear. Now, this may simply Liam, be an evolving issue and an evolving matter, but I think if you're going to talk about performance and accountability <coughs> at governance and board level, and there is that overall strategic responsibility for effective distribution of resource and therefore delivery of whatever it is that resource is for, having a clearer sense of what that performance framework is would be very helpful. Now, that, that may well be developing through that particular route. At the minute, because of some of the complexities associated with different sources of funding and different funding masters, so over the period of the last six months, we've had some significant discussions around the way that SDS funds activity that the college sector delivers, and as Paul said, really delighted that we're going to take that as a stepping stone approach rather than a, a full-scale shift, which it was intended to be, and we're very grateful that that, that situation's um, changed. But equally, we have in the widening access context funding coming via universities in terms of colleges living, uh, you know, first two years of degree provision, etc. So the, uh, we are developing in a short period of time a multiplicity of places from which sources of money come 
into a governance model then, that is then required to you know, effectively perform. And the outcome agreement process is not at a stage as yet where we can fully understand what that performance framework of measurement is. I mean, is it, 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 could some of this be captured within the, the, the code of conduct you talk about, or is, is that too high level, uh, too I broad don't believe, I don't believe it is too high level. I think in exactly the same way as you had a very interesting discussion with the higher education sector about their widening access outcome agreement and what will happen if they don't meet it. You know, having exactly the same conversation with the college sector, it's no different. And I think what's important in that context is, is the, the fact that the, the real benefits of regionalisation are around that regional coherence. And therefore, having a coherent approach in terms of that accountability and governance um, for post-16 students, whether you're in a university sector or a college sector, would be very helpful. So is there a fear then that having, I mean, your submission um, on behalf of Edinburgh College is, is very supportive of the broad principles and direction of travel. Um, but there's been a, a number of occasions now where you've seemed to have then suggested that the way in which the bill is phrased kind of cuts across the achievement of those broad principles, is that? I'm not, I'm not sure it's entirely purely just the way the bill is phrased. I think because there are some, as Susan has said, there are some unanswered questions for us in the way that lines of accountability work. It's, it's more difficult in some ways, Liam, to be, to be fully clear about how that process will work in terms of accountability. It's not trusting to the kind of regional strategic body or the regional board, <coughs> once it's established, once you've got the, the, the outcome agreement in place, then to be left to get on and, and, and deliver that without having kind of yes. inter intervention or yes. opportunities for intervention. Yes, at yes. Each and we'd every like day. to be left to get on, right. not on the basis of not being accountable, but on the basis of having a level of both professional and educational expertise and a level of board membership, which is about clear uh, stakeholder interest in communities and citizens and public that are doing things in the best interest of that region and of that region's public. Central planning... Um, can lead in some cases to some interesting unintended consequences of needing to always direct. Uh, we make the point very strongly in the College of Scotland submission, but equally in our own, around demographics. And Susan makes the point about age groups. You know, we are not suggesting for one minute that having that level of planning is not important, because of course it's important. You know, I have children too. Why wouldn't it be important? But at the end of the day, Lifelong learning is an agenda that's hugely important to us in the college sector. And those people who may be furthest removed at the minute from being economically active are not necessarily only aged under 24. And most young people, 16, 17, 18, sit in some sort of unit, be that a family or otherwise, in which there are members of that family that equally need support in terms of learning and education and the ability to get themselves into the workforce. So again, when you plan something so minutely and that then translates into a governance process, it won't always necessarily achieve the things that you want it to. So the autonomy is very important for those reasons. That would appear to be a clash between government policy in, in relation to the importance attached to youth, youth employment uh, and the, the, the priority that's been attached to um, 16 to 19, but also um, uh, up to 24-year-olds, and the wider mission of colleges um, in, in relation to lifelong learning. I'm not sure how you put in place a, 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 a either a code of um, practice or or, um, a, 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 or an outcome agreement that can can deal with that clash, because that just seems to be. Um, because what we're discussing is, is a process here, I would hope, from a reform point of view, which isn't going to be reformed again in a short period of time when the economic circumstances change. So, you know, if we are setting something out for the long term, which is what we hope we are doing, then you're right, Liam, policy and practice will, will always, <clears throat> there will always be a level of tension in terms of what we deliver. What we want to be clear about is the, is the autonomy that is there to be enable, able to respond and be responsive to what is needed at particular points in time. Um, and therefore, again, a level of central planning and dicta can sometimes lead, lead to some unintended consequences of that. Does anybody else want to come in on this issue? 
Okay, okay well, we'll start with Carol and then move right. on. Um, from my own region's perspective, having that flexibility in terms of um, student places and age groups is important because the actual number of 16 to 19 year olds um, who are making them, um, themselves available for work is decreasing because they're choosing to stay on at school. So we have a focus on, um, or the numbers <coughs> tend to be more the 18 to 24 year olds and the 24 plus. And we feel it's really important that um, there remains that flexibility within a region that a case is made for why perhaps numbers in a certain age group should be, should be higher or, or where that, that degree of flexibility um, enables the college to actually make that kind of decision in partnership with um, education services and, and other relevant partner bodies, if you like. So it's, we're still following government policy, but it's the understanding of your region and knowing why in some particular circumstances things may be different for, for that area. Clarify, um, what, what is there in the bill that stops that from happening? There isn't, there isn't anything in, in particular in the bill that stops that from happening. It's probably more in respect of the um, outcome agreements that we have with the Funding Council, where there's perhaps more direction in terms of focus on 16 to 19 year olds and trying to increase those numbers that come into the college sector. Thank you. Paul. And you know, from my part, I would agree. I don't think there's anything in the bill as it stands which prevents us focusing on local need. But just to enforce that point, um, coming from a, a region which is in the process of merging, I mean, the big issues that we are facing in terms of ensuring that we get strategy and governance appropriate to our local need is to ensure that we're able to offer a broad and balanced curriculum right across Aberdeenshire and that we ensure that we don't alienate or disengage with communities in the north, for instance, who might have concern that in centralising some of the curriculum that they'll be disenfranchised and that they, they will lose services which currently you know, are available to them in Fraserburgh. And there are big issues about, for instance, travelling, uh, student support, you know, cost, childcare. And despite the fact that we are assuring them you know, that the vision is to plan coherently and regionally but to deliver locally, which is what we understand to be the, the whole concept of putting learner at the centre, you know, I, th I think their view is time will tell. We'll need to see how this works through. And part of our issue is to ensure that we get representative governance, which understands the differences between a rural environment and a metropolitan environment, that we've got representation and buy-in, and that we have the flexibility within the arrangements which will fall out from the bill in implementing to be regional and to reflect the needs of the North East, to ensure that whilst we do focus on priority groups such as 16 to 19 year olds and others, that we also are able to take into account the needs of isolated communities, where you know they're, they're, it's a different, diverse kind of agenda there. Hey, Susan. <clears throat> I, I struggle to find the underpinning philosophy in this bill. When the 92 Act came out, it was very much market-driven. It was to set up a competitive uh, marketplace. And some colleges did well, and some colleges didn't do particularly well. And I think one of the, the weaknesses in that was those that did not do particularly well were not left to fall to the market. We, we, we kept them up because people understand that education is a social good. It's an absolute essential in a democratic society. And I'm, at the moment, I can see within this legislation some of the frustrations the government would have in terms of those colleges that perhaps fell below the standards that were expected of them. And when Mandy was talking about the, the issues about um, addressing government policy and also looking at the, the bill, I think the thing that's missing from it is plan is responsibility. We've got accountability, we've got autonomy, but we don't have anything about responsibility. So who is responsible? And I think if those questions were answered, who is responsible? Then it would actually help us understand what people want of us. Thank you. Uh, Claire Adamson and then Lee MacArthur. Yeah. Um, th thank you. Good morning. Um, you mentioned uh, it was mentioned putting the learner at this, the centre, and, and this is where, where the, the government has been driving all of this. And I can understand that outcome agreements have to have um, specific things about retention and destination and, and, and all those sort of generic things. But it was also my understanding that 
the, the flexibility and, and the regionalisational um, variances should be captured within the outcome agreement, and is that not where we get an outcome agreement right? We'll, we'll then make performance measurement automatic from that. I, I, yes. The, the, the outcome agreements, I think, are evolving. Um, from my own experience, we are beginning to use the outcome agreements to articulate a more ambitious and strategic vision for the region. And I think this is the second iteration of that. Uh, and I, I think that's a process that we'll all have to, to understand. Um, I, th I think outcome agreements ought to be medium, long-term focused, that they ought to, to be high level, they, they ought to encourage regions to be ambitious, to put the learner at the centre and to, you know, to come up with their own version of the future and not just be driven by a set of contractual numbers. But there are still, you know, inevitably that element of contract within it that, that makes some of the, how, I, in, in my experience, we've dealt with the outcome agreements as quite short term in terms of their vision. And I think that's something that we'll all have to learn from, to be quite honest, and, and move them on. Could I add to that from an Edinburgh board perspective? We have um, grappled a little with the conversation around doing strategy and planning and doing an outcome agreement. You know, we, and as a, as a board that's been in existence since the 1st of October, that's been quite a, a, a buoyant conversation. Um, and I know some members were here yesterday at the launch for Goodison of the Scottish Futures Forum um, as Scotland is a leading learning nation by 2025. And one of the benefits of that sort of scenario work is that it enables you as a board for your region, your region's benefit, both in a local, national and global context, to look a bit beyond where you are in an outcome agreement. So we've generally taken the view that the outcome agreement is falling out of that regional strategic direction, as opposed to necessarily only driving it. And that then, yes, does enable the opportunity to reflect more broadly and more widely, and particularly with that first section of the outcome agreement about efficient regional structures, to be able to uh, consider the direction of travel that you wish, to, you wish to take. Hence the point about governance and autonomous governance becomes very central. And uh, the appointment, therefore, of board members becomes very crucial in that particular context as well. Yeah, I'm just interested in Paul's comments about the way you've approached this and the specific challenges you face up in, in Aberdeenshire and talking about um, some of the challenges in relation to isolated uh, communities. Obviously, when I visited the, 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 the college a year or so back, there was a, I think, marked pride in the kind of federated arrangement that had been developed over over a period, not just between the colleges, but with the universities in the area as well. I mean, you talked um, this morning about trying to um, allay concerns about um, disenfranchising and centralising. I mean, there's clearly some anxiety within the student community, um, I think, um, amongst some members of staff as well that the boards have chosen to go down the route of, of merger, which really didn't seem to be the likely outcome 12 months ago. It would be helpful maybe if you could explain why it is you've come to this, this decision and indeed what the safeguards are for the likes of Bath and Buckingham College, which in terms of scale is, is, is um, markedly smaller than, 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 uh, than Aberdeen, uh, and how the sort of protection around um, specific rural funding um, is to be guaranteed in, uh, under the new structure. Okay, well, you, you are correct. I mean, in October of 2011, we signed a federation agreement. The, the two colleges were to work together to achieve regional coherence, but remain independent. Um, I, however, when we began to interpret the likely consequences of the bill um, from October, I think, of last year, what we recognised was, or what we felt was, the governance arrangements that would be required um, were we to remain a multi-college region and there to be two colleges were unnecessarily complex. We felt that it would serve the region and the learners best if we reviewed our options and following a fairly detailed options appraisal we, we chose to move ahead and create a new single regional college. And we, we, we out, from the outset, we were very clear about what we wanted to achieve, and we appraised our options against a set of agreed outcome criteria that the two boards agreed upon. 
and it's fair to say that there were, I think, two critical issues which probably tipped the decision in favour of a single college. One was efficient regional governance, simple regional governance, because we felt moving forward that we wanted to be outward focused, we wanted to be future focused, and we didn't want to effectively tie up time and resource in um, probably inward discussion around about two colleges and their relationship with a strategic planning body. And the other, of course, was the, the need for increased efficiencies in terms of achieving you know, uh, balanced budgets and ensuring that learners were well supported right across the region. So we, we, we came to that conclusion. In terms of protections, we have written to uh, the Scottish Funding Council and informed them of our decision, but asked for assurances about rural funding. And we've had a positive response. We have created and are in the process of creating a strategic vision. Uh, the two boards working very closely together. I think there is a degree of harmony and sense of purpose between the two boards. And what we're now doing is ensuring that we articulate that vision <coughs> and put structures in place to ensure that learners and the communities of Fraser Repeat Ahead will not lose out. You know, right up there, high up, uh, I think our first key outcome is the maintenance of services to learners in, in Fraserburgh. So we, we are talking to students and talking to staff about efficiencies, but not at the level of curriculum. It's business as usual, and we're trying to maintain that. That what will be a challenge. And I think, if I'm honest as well, there's a sense of, well, well, we'll see how it goes. You know, I mean, students want to actually see some detailed planning in place, and we're not there yet. For next year, it's business as usual. For the year after and the year after, then we haven't as yet done a detailed curriculum plan. However, we recognise, because of travel issues and because of all of the issues you would expect in, in a rural environment, that students want access to FE locally. They don't want to have to travel for an hour and a half a day. And we're aware of that, and we've assured them that that's our ambition. Well, it's interesting you, you say that, because I think um, uh, the... The suggestion that the bill itself is a catalyst for moving to a merger model rather than um, sticking with a, a development of the, the, the federation um, doesn't necessarily chime with the um, what we've been told that, that um, mergers will only happen where they're driven from the bottom up and on the basis of um, uh, academic um, improvement and, and, and what's delivered uh, for for students. I mean, what you're saying is that this is on looking at the bill. Um, there was a, a, a recognition that the, the best way of making this work, if you like, was to go down the route to merger. And also, just slightly concerned about your um, description of the benefits of simplicity and efficiency, which I can, I can understand in terms of a, a merged model. But actually, sometimes efficiency and simplicity um, overrides some of the granularity and the and, and the, um, the, the, the the kind of um, the messiness of reflecting different need um, and, and and opportunities across a region and and therefore I suppose there would be a concern then that that is the driving force and that that, that maybe the eye has been taken off the ball in terms of reflecting um, the needs across that region particularly in. Banff and Buchan or, or, or in the more rural parts of, uh, of that region. Would that be fair at all or is that something that you, can, you see being um, uh, safeguarded against in terms of um, the, the outcome agreement that you're signing? The, no, no I, I, I think we will put in place safeguards. I, I'm, it is our intention that the, that the the disaggregation of activity across that region, which will be led by regional need, which will be led by learner need, will be on the basis of planning regionally but delivering locally. And we have, we're deriving a strategic plan which articulates those objectives very clearly. And that strategic plan, as Mandy said, will drive our regional outcome agreement where we'll make it quite clear that there will continue to be services for learners in the northeast, the simplicity that you referred to, I think there is an issue about the the simplicity and ease of governing, in particular, and managing with one board. 
you know, as opposed to a board and assigned colleges. And I think given the, you know, the, the desire to move on and to move forward and to, to plan ambitiously for the future, we believe we can achieve that more coherently in a single college region. It's interesting, it's a long journey in a short space of time, from signing a, a, a federation agreement in October 2010 to oh. coming to that conclusion within two years. Is but, I mean, the environment has changed significantly in that period of time. And we've responded to changes in the environment, and we've reflected on that decision at the time. And always, you know, I, I think we were, we were keeping a weather eye on the middle ground in terms of the operating circumstances we would find ourselves, and we've taken that decision, and we've, you know, and that, and that decision wasn't made lightly. I mean, it was made on the basis of a fairly detailed uh, options appraisal, a, a consultation exercise, and a consultation exercise will, which will be ongoing. And the consultation exercise and a lot of our activity from now to the point at which we arrive at a vesting day will be how. And what will the college look like? What will this new single regional college look like? And how will it prioritise the needs of learners? <clears throat> I am, I'm keen to move on, but we're, you have mentioned uh, a number of times accountability, autonomy, funding, all these kind of areas. I know we're, we're, we're keen to, to explore some of those issues. So I've got uh, Liz, and then Joan, and then Colin. Uh, thank you, convener. Uh, just on the question, in the Ecology Scotland uh, submission, there was quite a uh, a strong questioning of uh, the situation where uh, the principal of an assigned college uh, would be appointed by the regional board. And it says very clearly there that there does not appear to be any precedent for this model in the public sector in Scotland where the terms and conditions, including a performance review and remuneration of the principal, is set by one legal entity but the contract of employment held with another uh, legal entity. Do you have concerns about that? I think the only person here at the moment that that would actually affect. Uh, I think the issue is about the role of the employer in relation to their employees, and it doesn't matter whether it's the principal or a lecturer or a member of support staff. Employers have both rights and responsibilities, and I think what the bill describes at the moment actually takes apart the relationship, that contractual obligation, as well as the psychological obligation that employers have with their employees. So if the principal of an assigned college has uh, a relationship with the regional strategic board which defines that person's salary, their terms, conditions. Where, where does the loyalty lie? Does it lie with the assigned college? Does it lie with the regional strategic board? And in terms of the assigned college, its relationship in terms of funding with the regional strategic board may only be 70 odd percent of its total funding. So the principal should also have the, the drive to make sure that the additional funding continues to be uh, generated by that college. So I think there's an inherent tension there. I think there's a legal issue in terms of uh, employment legislation, but I think there's also a psychological issue. In order to get the best from that individual, I think there needs to be clarity. Follow up on that slightly because I'm, I'm maybe slightly confused here, but you, you seem to be suggesting that was a unique position. What's the difference between what you've just described and um, previously? I mean, I, I worked for Strathclyde Fire Brigade. My conditions of service and pay and everything else were set by Strathclyde Regional Council. Um, what's what's the, you know where did my loyalties lie? And what's the difference there between the Regional Council setting my pay and conditions, but the but I worked for a particular entity within that organisation, which was Strathclyde Fire Brigade. And I think you've just answered that. It was a particular entity within that. The, the fire service, my understanding of the legal standing in terms of the fire service was that it wasn't an incorporated body. The assigned colleges will still be incorporated bodies, and I think that's where the tension is. Uh -huh. That's my understanding, yes. OK, I'm sure that's something we'll explore uh, as we go along. Joan. Yes, well, mine was a supplementary to Liam MacArthur's line of questioning a couple of questions back, if that's OK. Um, Paul was talking about, um, uh, Liam was asking Paul about the, the challenges of, of making sure that all the colleges in the, the region uh, were, all the uh, outlying areas were catered for. And I just wanted to ask Carol, as someone who already has a single college region in a rural area, how she has found that works, whether it works effectively in the Galloway. Um, 
I think that um, as a college, as you know, Joan, we, we have two campuses, one in Dumfries and one in Stranraer, which are 75 miles apart. So there is the challenge there about managing multi-campuses. In terms of moving to um, a regional board, it's in theory, it's fairly straightforward for us. We already have strong partnerships in Dumfries and Galloway because we're in, some in some senses we're lucky. We have one local authority, one local NHS, so it's easier for us to get together. I think the, the regionalisation agenda will help strengthen those links uh, and to a certain extent formalise them. And we also have the unique situation where um, we do have a regional lead appointed in Dumfries and Galloway, Dame Barbara Kelly, but her role is about um, bringing the universities and the college together on the Crichton campus and to look at learning for Dumfries and Galloway um, from, from that particular. So funding will still come to our college regional board, will still be administered by our college regional board, but we will have an obligation and a part to play in terms of the overall kind of Crichton campus arrangements as well. And for me, the, the, the important aspect there will be the relationship between the chair of that group and the chair of the regional board and how they will work together in terms of going forward. Thank you very much. Okay. Colin. Thank you, Mayor. I think uh, most members of the panel have uh, mentioned their concerns about the balance between uh, accountability and autonomy. And it's obviously very important to get that right. Obviously, from the government's point of view, accountability means making sure that the, the public funds are being spent in the right way, on the right things, and that the results are coming out as, a, 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 as part of that. Do you think that outcome agreements are going to be able to encompass uh, accountability in terms of uh, what the colleges are doing? Are they going to be able to deliver uh, that reassurance? Uh, I think it's about looking at how colleges actually plan their business and that's round about and I'll use Glasgow as an example because it's probably more complex than any of the other emerging regions. At the moment we have seven colleges who work collaboratively we share an economic and skills analysis in terms of what is actually required by the wider Glasgow region as well as Glasgow City and from that we develop a portfolio the provision that we will then offer we also, alongside that, develop a set of performance measures for ourselves. Every college will have its own balanced scorecard, its own way of measuring its own performance. Having delivered that portfolio, hopefully effectively and efficiently, and at a standard which we find acceptable for our students, we then look at our own performance. Those performance measures will contribute to the regional outcome agreement, but it's not all the regional outcome agreement. The regional outcome agreements, as they are evolving, are, we're now looking at something like 10, I think it's 10 measures and 29 indicators to be included within regional outcome agreements. My concern is that we will end up with detailed strategic planning and we will lose the responsiveness that we actually need to answer the, the requirements of employers or schools or university partners. So I think it's about, we do need to be accountable for the public money. We are stewards of that money. It's not ours. And therefore, we need to have someone to say, I'm giving you this, but I want X, Y, and Z for it. The, the colleges always look at all those other performance measures, because it's not just about the money. For us, accountability is also about stewardship, and it's about good <coughs> behaviour in governance. So there is the public financial accountability element of it, but there is also the behaviour element of it as well. And I think that is something that we all feel very strongly about in terms of how our sector is governed. So I don't know if that actually answers your question. Well, I'm looking at a fairly simple point of view. You've got, for example, local authorities that have outcome agreements which they agree with the government. And they, like yourselves, have a wide range of other indicators that they use on a day-to-day -day basis to manage their business. Wouldn't that be the sort of model you'd be looking at? You'd still have all your indicators for your day-to-day -day business, but you would have the high-level outcome agreements. Any of us would dispute the fact that high-level outcome agreements are useful. The issue is that they are now, at this moment, moving towards you know, 10 measures and 29 indicators. I have to say it's much better than the 129 financial indicators that we had at one point. So you know, there is an improvement there. 
But my concern is that it will lose the flexibility. It will become reified. And then we won't have that flexibility that allows really good, dynamic colleges to do the things that Scotland needs it to do. So how would you see the colleges accounting to the government for the money spent? I think you, you do have a number of indicators. But in terms of the regional outcome agreements, what we don't want is something to say, we'll have 374 16 to 19 year olds, we'll have 29 hairdressers, we'll have that kind of, of level of detail is unhelpful. It is about actually qualitative and quantitative measures of the colleges. And some of that, I'm sure every college that's represented here, will have employer engagement surveys. Uh, they will actually work with schools and universities. So it's about not losing that qualitative element as well as the quantitative. And if I am asked to deliver 74,323 weighted sums, you can bet your bottom dollar there will be more than 73,423 weighted sums delivered. But given the fact that, uh, for example, the government, and I think supported by most political parties, is focusing very much on things like youth unemployment and employability, particularly in the 16-24 in the range, would you not see that uh, perhaps there would be an outcome agreement that would focus, focus more or less on that? which the colleges would have to deliver against. And that may well be within kind of broad parameters. So it might be, you know, between 600 and 650 places focused on 16 to 19 year olds or 24 plus. One of the things that's happened recently is that the Funding Council has actually changed the date at which the age uh, is measured for 16 to 19 year olds. So in Glasgow, where we did actually count all the 16 to 19 year olds, the SFC moved the date and now we've got fewer 16 to 19 year olds in our colleges according to the statistics, when the facts are we have many, many more. So there is an issue about statistics and how that evidence is gathered. Colin, could I add a note from a, our perspective? As, as, as you know, we try and work closely in terms of single outcome agreements across the three authorities in the area that Edinburgh College supports. And uh, as you know, we've been very welcoming of the government's position in terms of the review of the process for community planning. Um, and I think that process there in terms of, again, autonomy and governance and the way that partnerships work together effectively holding partners to account is something that I hope we're learning from in terms of this process moving forward for regionalisation and colleges, because I think there's real value and real advantage in that. Um, it, there's always a huge challenge at a college level, at board level, to try and um, demonstrate the golden thread that exists between your own strategic planning process and three other community planning single outcome agreements. So actually the way that things are moving forward is really very helpful and very positive. Equally, I think we are acknowledging of the fact of the government's need to take a national view on certain things. So in a, in a, to be able to gather information and data around a particular policy or national issue. Um, and again, therefore, within an outcome agreement process, having a high level indicator, as Susan says, that responds to a particular point um, is very helpful from a national position. It's ensuring, however, as we do in community planning, that when we look at that national policy position, we reflect it appropriately within our local context and region, rather than it being driven from a central perspective. If we've made a guarantee of a place in educational training for all, then we should be able to measure whether we're achieving that or not. But colleges are only one part of that process and one part of that measurement. So I think the, the, the coming together of what we're doing in terms of developing and evolving outcome agreements um, on the back of all the experience there is from local authority and the way the government's arra arrangements are changing is really helpful. Um, but where, what, we, what we want to try and avoid are some of the things we have gone through in local authority environments over the last five or six years um, of getting too bedeviled with the detail and having mammoth documents that try and track and plan with lots of different indicators about where we are and the things. And I think Sir John Elvridge was well noted for saying um, that often we can meet the target and miss the point. You know, we'd like to keep to the point. 
Finlay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> in in uh, colleges' submission, they say we believe savings and efficiencies can be achieved, but the current pace of financial cuts runs the risk of creating a funding crisis and short-term staff and educational difficulties, which mitigate against successful achievement of these positive changes. And Angus uh, Council say that, however, in practice, recent changes to college funding for college school partnerships have already restricted the range and volume of provision available to young people. My question really is, looking at the submissions that we've had, if I was to summarise them, they would say we support the principle of regionalisation, but, but the, in practice it's been undermined by the depth and speed of the cuts that are being imposed. Could I ask you to comment on that and give us some um, evidence as to how the cuts are impacting in your particular institution? I, I just picked that up as a general point. I'm sure colleagues will come in. Um, the pace is what's probably, uh, Neil, been the most challenging aspect of this. And I alluded earlier to not just pace, but complexity in terms of different environments from where funding is coming. Because we might say, in some respects, funding is being moved around rather than necessarily entirely taken away. And it's that complexity that's as challenging as the total size of the pot and the size of money that's actually available. So pace is a thing that, from an Edinburgh College point of view, we've had conversations all along since we moved towards merger. Um, the impact of that in terms of cuts um, is not something in the Edinburgh context that we're experiencing. We are not cutting any provision. We haven't cut any provision. Um, um, does that include provision for part-time students, students with disabilities? So. If I was to ask your college for statistics on that, you would show exactly the same provision as you have done in previous years? We wouldn't show exactly the same provision because we never show exactly the same provision you know, year on year in any particular context. But what we would be able to show is no material or significant shift and change for any particular group being specifically disadvantaged. What we would show is an increase in class sizes, um, what we would show is an increase in what I would call productivity and what staff would call hard work. Um, and those things are measures that are very relevant um, to us being able to maintain resource as close to students as possible. Where we are enacting cuts is within the context of management and merger. And again, it's the pace of that that's causing us you know, real challenges. So then I can get others to address yeah. this as well. Um, could you address maybe um, staffing numbers and um, quality of provision? Well, quality of provision has been maintained from our perspective. Um, we've recently had our annual engagement visit from the HMIE. Um, the two colleges, both what was Stevenson College and was Telford College, had most recent HMI inspection reports. Um, our view is that we are doing our level best to keep resource as close to students as possible, hence my reference to the management changes, in order not to affect that, that quality. So, can you maybe just to be helpful if I could follow up and point that and maybe go through each of the events? Well, one final question. Just so that I don't... And then we'll in, in terms of Edinburgh, two, two <coughs> final issues. Um, I understand that and I may be wrong on this, but this is what I've been hearing from constituents, that Edinburgh College usually produces its perspective, prospectus about nine months prior to the courses beginning. Has, has that, and that has not been produced, or it's been delayed? And second, and what is the reason for that? And secondly, um, can you confirm that the, the cost of the merger process has been 17 million so far? Okay, in answer to the first question, as you can imagine, you know, when you bring three organisations together and they have you know, 5,500 courses and a curriculum that's broad, putting that into a single place and space as a single document overnight is, is quite a task. We have actually launched our new curriculum offer literally last week, um, and that curriculum offer has been reviewed with a wide range of staff over quite a long period of time, including time leading up to the merger as well. So that, that is out, and it's, it's in the, the public domain um, and it will continue probably to be tweaked and altered as we, as we move forward in order to actually address some of the sheer logistics rather than anything else associated with that. And no, I cannot confirm that the cost of the merger has been £17.6 million. That was a figure that was originally quoted in terms of a bid that went into the transformational fund to the government um, at a very early stage. If you remember, again, we were going through what was a very rapid period of change and process. We were asked to give some... 
uh, indication of what we thought potential cost might be. That figure reduced in the business case that was presented part of the merge proposal in the April of that year to 14.2 million. Um, to date, we have spent 5.8 million of cost in terms of the merger process. Do you expect it to be 14 million? Um, we don't expect it to be quite as much as that, no. But again, um, as we're moving forward, there are complexities in terms of releasing of staff through things like voluntary severance schemes, etc. Some of these things are quite difficult to predict, as I noted in our, our response to you. Um, and we've had less cost in some instances to do with IT infrastructure than we anticipated having. So. Cost, bulk of the cost would be on um, uh, redundancy. Deal, no, no, I said we'll get the, other, uh, get the rest of the panel. Yeah, to, to yeah, these are important points. Can well, be they are important and points. And we did spend 45 minutes on the previous section, so I think... Uh, no, they, are, <laughs> they are important points. And I said, do you just wrap up those questions and we'll ask... Because I want all the panel to answer your questions. Yeah, absolutely. So let's... Let's, let's try and learn. And if you want any final question, I'll yep. let you come back in after all the panel members have answered. So let's move along. Carol, could you try and uh, summarise some of the uh, points that uh, Mr Finlay's raised? Um, in, in relation to the, the cuts, as a small rural college, it's a real challenge for us to achieve economies of scale and to achieve efficiencies. We do have two campus sites, and because of the distance apart, um, it makes it really difficult. That we do, there's no choice but to duplicate some of the cost, etc. Um, uh, three years ago, the previous principal and the board recognised that the public sector resource was going to be reduced uh, and took um, steps then um, in terms of um, reducing the, the size of our staff complement, etc. And because of that, we've actually been able to then maintain our student numbers and our, uh, within the budgets that we've been afforded up until this, up until this point. Where we have um, had to reduce is in our part-time provision. Um, so the focus and the funding has very much moved from uh, part-time. So where we had perhaps 8,000 part-time enrolments three or four years ago, we're maybe now down to about 4,000 in total. Um, and that's where we've had to shift our resource to focus on full-time places for young people. And in terms of the other issues in relation to staff losses and uh, uh, and the like, um, you know, how many staff have gone? Um, there was a total of 41 members of staff left um, three years ago. Now they weren't all full time, um, and since then we've maintained our staffing complement, and we anticipate for 13, 14 that we'll be able to do the same. For 41 out of how many? Um, I think at that time it was nearly a 300. Okay. Um, over the last two years, our staff FTE, full-time equivalent, has dropped from 237 to 220. That's been through a process of non-replacement of staff once they've left and staff that have taken uh, voluntary severance. Our student, um, the, the activity around about our weighted sums has fallen. We, like Carol, have prioritised in the first instance full-time provision for 16 to 19 year olds, 19 to 24 year olds, workforce development. We see less short part-time engagement. So in the past we would have had at the, typically around about 8,000 enrolments. A significant number would be part-time. Now that's fallen to, to near 6,000. We have over the last two years um, closed two of our outreach centres, which were in the west of our area, uh, Keith and Huntley. We've, we still operate in that area. We still train, we still offer programmes, but we don't do it from a bespoke centre which we lease. You know, so we've, we've found a way to, to work with partners to use their premises. And we work with fewer schools than we used to. I think that the college probably delivered a greater proportion than a lot of, uh, of its sums in schools than a lot of other colleges. And we, we've cut that back. So in the past, we possibly worked with 14 schools. Now we work with six or seven. And we, we prioritise those schools from whom we recruit full-time students so that we can begin, I suppose, that journey and support their transitions into the college more effectively. So there were some schools that you know, in a rural college are in danger of 
falling twixt and between colleges. You know, they, they, they sit in, in the middle. And we, we are working closely in a coherent regional way to ensure that we can plan that provision more effectively. Thanks. Uh, in the case of Cardonald, uh, our portfolio has changed slightly over the last four years. So some of this actually happened before uh, any talk of regionalisation and merger activity came into play. Some of that was around, and you specifically asked about learning support and part-time staff, uh, part-time students. We were delivering 21% of our provision in learning support areas, and some of that was well outside our region. We were providing it as a college in the southwest of Glasgow, in Port Glasgow, uh, far away from what would be our normal catchment areas. So one of the things that we did was we rebalanced the curriculum. Like other colleges, we focused on the government priorities, 16 to 19-year-olds, key sectors. But we also looked at a number of measures internally. We did increase, increase class sizes. Uh, we looked at alternative ways of delivering, not just for students, but also in terms of the staff. And we have managed to more or less maintain the, the levels of activity. And some of that is around staff being willing and flexible to take on different roles and to look at different ways of doing things. A really simple example would be, we would normally send two staff every year to do their teaching qualification. And it's very expensive. But working with the trade unions and with the staff, we came up with a new model. And for the last two years, we've sent 14 staff to go and do their teaching qualification because the staff themselves gave up teaching remission time in order to allow that to happen. So it's really been through collaboration and cooperation. We've managed to do things in terms of alternative delivery. Like everyone else, we've lost staff all of it through voluntary severance. We lost 50 FTE over the last two years out of 450. We have increased the productivity, and we have also looked at moving what was publicly funded courses into commercially funded courses. So if you want to do patchwork quilting in the south and west of Glasgow, then you will have to pay for it now. And that has released the weighted sum activity for us to then take in more students in other areas. And we've also increased our commercial income. We have a sales team that go and knock on doors and sell our provision to employers. Uh, now that takes a lot of effort from staff whose main focus is on supporting students. But we've been able to do that. Therefore, as a large college in what will be a multi-college region, I'm frightened that I lose the ability to respond in those ways. Yeah, just two very brief points. Uh, the uh, straight question, is your college, or what are the reserves at your college? And second one, um, do you believe the bill is being driven by financial priorities or education priorities? In terms of reserves, there's obviously you know a lot of discussion of what is a reserve. The amount of cash that uh, Clyde College will have on the 1st of August, in terms of available cash, we'll have £8 million. Sorry? Yeah, I don't know if you want to do one at a time and education or financial priorities. I think it's about frustration in some cases in terms of the sector you know, being able to fulfil its potential. I honestly don't have a view. I really do not have a view as to whether it is you know, political, is it financial, is it educational. What I do know is that the college sector will find the best way to respond it's our job to try and influence government in terms of how we can best help Scotland's learners. It's the mandate of the government, because they are elected, to make those decisions. In terms of the, the financial element of it, it's our job to try and persuade people that actually we're a really good investment. You know, want to give your, your view, mm -hmm. but you must have one. <laughs> um, you know, what you believe is the, the driver be, behind this. Quite, okay. you're, you're quite right, I do have one, and I'm not giving it. <laughs> okay, Paul. Um, ca cash reserves under a million. I, I couldn't put an accurate figure on that today, but relatively small for a, a relatively small rural college with um, you know, annual turnover around about 10 or 11 million. Uh, varies, obviously, depending upon other contracts that we manage to bring in. So, so not substantial reserves. And do I believe... What, what do I believe? I think it's, I mean, quite honestly, there's an element of both in this. I think there are, you know, there are some educational advantages in coherence that we welcome. <laughs> and, and however, very clearly, there are a whole set of external priorities and difficulties that we all face, and we know that. 
we understand that. Um, so it seems to me it's a bit of both. Um, again, I can't give you the exact figure, but our, our reserves are very small. Um, um, in terms of our priorities, um, my, my challenge is maintaining breadth of provision going forward as a small rural college and as the only college in a, ru in a rural area. Um, for a lot of our students, it, it would be very difficult if they had to travel elsewhere for, um, for their courses. So for us going forward, that's always a priority for us, but it's also the big challenge for us is making sure we align our curriculum to the economy, but that we also maintain that breadth of curriculum um, for um, all of our learners that come to the college. Um, for Edinburgh College, our cash position in terms of working capital is around 11 million. Um, to give you an, an idea of that in context, it's um, excluding the, the funding council additional funds we have for restructuring, it's about a 68 million turnover and our salary bill is about 4.9 million. Um, so therefore we you know, have a couple of months worth of money to trade on basically, so not huge cash reserves. Um, in terms of the motivation, um, you and I had a brief conversation about this a little yesterday, Neil. My, my view is that uh, there's been a process in terms of educational reform that's been going on in Scotland over a number of years now. Um, and uh, I welcome this part of this process in terms of reform from an educational perspective. Um, I think that I've, I've worked all my life in the college sector. I have a huge commitment to ensuring that this ability to become this world leading learning organization of Scotland alongside tackling social inequalities and social justice is absolutely the right sort of direction of travel to go in. And I do believe that this form of regional reform will help with that. But I equally believe that the pace at which it's operating is probably a damn sight faster because of the economy in which we find ourselves. And it would have been in some ways far more ideal to have gone down an educational route in a slightly more measured way, um, but we are where we are. Thank you, everybody. Um, uh, Neil Burby. Just, just, to f just to follow up on Neil Finlay's uh, questions, what do you think will have the biggest impact on student learning, um, this bill or continuing staffing and funding cuts? So this bill or Con continuing staffing cuts and, and funding cuts to colleges, what will have the biggest impact on student learning? Funding cuts. Um, so I'm not sure I understand. I mean, yeah. The panel seems to be the same difficulty I'm having. Here. What, what exactly do you mean by the question? Perhaps you could expand on it. It'll be so well, clear. Well, I think I think in terms in terms of what will have the biggest effect on student learning, the provision of learning, the quality of learning, will this bill make a bigger impact on student learning and, and the positive impact on student learning, or will it be affected more? by funding cuts and staffing cuts, what is more important in, in terms of um, delivering provision to students? We should always find resources to support those that need support most. We should always try and find those resources. Um, and how we find them, however, through a process of regionalisation in the longer term could be better. So based on us working in a more regionally coherent way, looking at the relationship that we have with universities, with local authorities, with community learning and development, and being a taxpayer myself and a citizen and considering that public pound, my view is that in the long term, it could be better. The, the process of reform could help us to spend that money more effectively and better. But of course, if you take money away in the short term, it has an impact, and it always has a disproportional impact on those that need it most, and whether that's whether you're reforming welfare or whether you're reforming education. Philosophically, that's not a place I'd really like to be in, but I do think this process in terms of regionalization could ultimately benefit a wider group in the longer term, greater. I, I would certainly support Mandy's view in that. I think um, that regionalization um, will bring added benefits both in terms of working closely with the university sector for articulation, working with um, education services and local authorities and employability partnerships, which means that um, together we are addressing what the specific needs are of a region as well as addressing local, uh, sorry, national level needs. But 
as always, yes, budgets are extremely important and, you know, everybody across the public sector is extremely stretched and we have to recognise that and be innovative and creative about how we address those issues. I think from my point of view that, you know, it depends for how much longer and how deep those cuts would continue to be, to give you a, you know, a yes or no answer to that. But if you were to, if I was to turn the question around and you were to say to me, um, what has the potential to affect the greatest improvement and the greatest sort of impact on positive outcomes in terms of the sector, that then accepting all the positives within the bill, which we do, that then I would say that you know if, if there was a means and and I, I you know I realise this is a, a wish list, but an opportunity to reverse that, then I think we could take the reforms that you know we've embraced, we could exploit all of the advantages through regional coherent planning, joined upness with schools, with universities, with employers, with each other, and with additional, or, or with an arresting of that fall, that decline, that cliff that we're facing, if something were able to be done, then we could exploit that more effectively. I think regionalisation has the potential for great benefits and those of us who worked in previous regional administrations could see some of those benefits. But in those previous regional administrations, there was also strictures. There were uh, barriers to innovation and creativity. And I would hope that we would maintain the benefits that previously we had within regions, but that we would make sure that we don't reify the system. Because when that happens, then colleges start to be sluggish and they don't respond quickly and they don't do the things that Scotland's communities and people and employers need. I think that the regionalisation, the post-16 bill as it stands, would be improved with clarity. I think there has to be definitions about responsibility, what exactly is good and bad performance. And I think there's something about the partners working. This bill is full of the colleges will do, the colleges will do. But it also it doesn't ask of other partners. It doesn't say what the Funding Council will do for us to help us. It doesn't say what SDS will do for us. It doesn't say what the universities will do for us. Your question was, you know, would be, you know, which is going to bring the greatest benefit? The answer will be, we do need a level of investment in Scotland's colleges. I'm not talking about buildings. I am talking about an ongoing revenue stream that allows us to invest in Scotland's people. The regionalisation is just a mechanism to help us make that investment count for more. Thank you. Claire, did you have a question? And we did we touched upon um, it was on the surpluses. surpluses but, um, okay. yeah. um, in Professor Gregg's review of further education governance in Scotland, he actually recommends that the college surplus should be limited to ten percent of the annual revenue. Um, and I'd be interested to know what you um, uh, position is on, on, on that recommendation. Obviously the, the figures we've been given is that there's £200 million worth of reserves in the sector. There's huge variations across different colleges because of this of um, competition model that was set up. Um, and, and I would really like to ask, you know, obviously, um, Mandy, you mentioned, you know, you had two months worth of, of um, operating costs. And I can understand that in a sort of business context um, when you're in a position where you, you're not sort of almost guaranteed another source of fund, funding. But is, is that reasonable to say that, given that the, the funding from the government or, and other sources isn't going to dry up overnight in a college context? Um, I think there's a couple of things there. I think the Audit Scotland report in relation to Scotland's colleges is also a helpful resource in terms of understanding the health of the sector. Um, with respect to our, our own college, um, there is an obvious advantage to being a body that is funded by government, because in some ways your bond is there and clear when you are working in partnership with citizens or with employers or businesses or, or others. Um, but equally, uh, under, as Susan alluded to, the number of financial health indicators we've had as a sector over the years, you know, 60 days cash in hand is not the best you know, if you were looking, I sit as a director on a couple of other companies, and I, I'm not enamoured when there's that much cash only in the system. And why is that? Well, because there are so many things that can happen. Um, there are so many adverse opportunities that can come across, and particularly in the so sort of economic climate that we're in at the minute. 
So I, I do think, despite the fact, I mean, reserves is an interesting term in its own right. Uh, I, I know Scotland's colleges, the colleges of Scotland, doing a little bit of work to unpick some of that so we can get a sort of clearer picture on what is actually liquid, what is cash, what is real working capital versus what is reserves in a, in a broader sense. Um, so it feels tight to me. It feels tight to me, is the honest answer to that question. I'd rather have you know, 90 to 100 days worth of working capital in terms of cash than 50 to 60. So I, mean, I take Claire's point. I mean, effectively, if you're a business and you're operating, you can, you can perhaps, although it's unlikely, you can still see the point where, you know, on the 1st of March, you have zero income, and that, those, that money will have to keep you going. That just isn't going to happen with a college. So suggesting that you have 60 days reserves, it doesn't, isn't really a way of describing it that operates in the real world, is it? Well... I think this is a little where it depends on, you know, strategic direction in terms of colleges and what we do as in a, a wider context moving forward. Uh, just to put that in context, for Edinburgh College, of our turnover, about 15% of that, 10 to £11 million, comes from sources other than public funding. Um, and that money generates a bottom line, and that bottom line is used to reinvest in some of the activity that's really quite expensive to do in places that we really can't afford to do it. So actually, if you're trying to be diverse and you're trying to be sustainable as an institution in the long term, I would suggest that having a variety of sources of funding um, that you generate to help with that, as Susan's described, becomes really quite important. You know, as charitable organisations, what we do is try and identify other areas of activity that will help underpin supporting local communities and local citizens. So I view it differently for those sorts of reasons. And it's not because there isn't a, an acknowledgement that there's a certain amount of money that will always be coming if you contract to do a certain amount of business. Um, but as we've seen recently, the money's gone down quite a lot. The income could suddenly turn to zero. Uh, overnight, um, and therefore no, you would have to use the money. Described as if it could suddenly turn to zero. No, you didn't say that. You said you had 60 days. But, but but if you're in a position where really you want to be really comfortable about sustaining your workforce, paying your staff, meeting your bills, um, paying things within a 30-day period, committing to all the things that you think are really important, you know, cash flow is important, working capital is important, and you ask for my view, that's my view. Absolutely. And um, can I also just the Audit Scotland report. You may agree or disagree with it, but Audit Scotland um, stated that the, the, the figures quite clearly in the report about what they viewed as reserves, and they split it into two categories. Um, but also indicated, and I think this is correct, that the, the reserves that you have have doubled over the last few years. What's your view of uh, the sector using some of that uh, reserves for the ongoing work um, at the moment? Susan? I think it's about the, the classification of reserves. Um, at the moment, the legislative framework that we operate in has as autonomous independent organisations. We therefore have to ensure that we are going concerns. And I think that's where Mandy's point about you know, having available cash comes in. But the, the reserves that we have aren't stuffed in the bank. They don't... Um, well, they are actually stuffed in the bank because we do have treasury management policies to make sure that we maximise the income that we get from that money because it's for reinvesting in students. It's about ensuring that our staff are well trained. It's about the capital investment that we make in our estates. But it's also about the changing pedagogy that we have because we are moving from, you know, a lot of classroom-based delivery to more use of e-learning, independent learning. So it's there with an investment plan. It's not just sitting in a cupboard somewhere. And I think it's important that you know colleges have been prudent and have shown that they can generate income, but not all colleges can. One of the colleges in the Glasgow Colleges Strategic Partnership, John Wheatley and Easter House, you know, huge social challenges entirely different kind of portfolio from my college. You know, I can go out and sell to the Saudi Arabian government. They can't do that. So uh, your question about, you know, should we have the reserves? I think reserves are important. Uh, should they be used for the benefit of the sector? I think that's about national coherence as well, because we've actually talked a lot about regions providing coherence internally. As yet, no one has told me who's going to provide the coherence of 
the regions. So if you look at that a sort of level up, and I think that your question can only really be answered if we know what that national coherence is going to be, because it would appear that to date it's not existed. Thank you very much. Um, Liam MacArthur, you have some questions. Yeah, just um, briefly, a couple of points on um, governance issues we've been not touched on. Um, within the bill, there's obviously a statutory requirement for staff and student representation on the on the boards and strategic uh, bodies. We've had uh, evidence, including I think from um, uh, Edinburgh College, about uh, the absence of any requirement for the uh, principal um, to remain a member of the, the regional college board. We've also had evidence um, from asset skills uh, about their concerns in relation to the lack of statutory representation for uh, employers uh, on, on the board. I wonder whether um, you could perhaps uh, expand on the concerns you have in relation to the principal, but also touch on, I suppose, what underlies the concern in relation to uh, employer uh, engagement and whether the absence of a, uh, a provision within the bill for employee representation is a, is a weakness or, or whether it can be addressed in other ways. And so in terms of the employee representation, I actually feel extremely strongly about this. At the moment, the existing legislation has a teaching staff uh, member and a support staff member, and they are members, they are full members of the board, they are not representatives. And in the, the bill, I think it's, I think there is a weakness if we do not have a broad teaching represent and support staff representation there. If you have a college which has only got one representative, members of staff, one board member, members of staff have different perspectives, they have uh, different views, they have different aspirations. And I think that I would be much more comfortable on any board, whether it's an assigned co college board or uh, a regional board or a regional strategic board, that the totality of college staff is, is actually present on that board. To um, the Edinburgh College position, uh, you know, we we have we are moving towards. We've been trying to configure our board development uh, and the evolving board in the context of where a regional board will will sit. Um, so, with respect to staff and student representation, we we sit with two members of staff and a student, and we will continue to do so in that vein as we move forward with legislation. When it comes to employers. Um, as a statutory board member, in inverted commas, I'm, I'm sort of, of in two minds in many respects, Liam. I mean, I think what's really, really important is the board is appropriately reflective of the needs of that regional economy and that national context. And therefore, if you have not got good employer representation on that board, you've, in my view, not got a good balance of board membership. Um, but whether it should be you know, a required member is not something that I would necessarily subscribe to. Again, it goes back to the earlier point of the question from Liz about you know, the composition, autonomy, etc., and the point we we're making about who appoints the board. And I think if you've got that wider autonomy, you can ensure that you've got that very good mix of board membership. Uh, the point that my board has made with respect to the membership of the principal on any board is about the role that... Um, a principal, I sort of hesitate to talk about this in a way because I feel I obviously have a vested interest, but um, the role that a principal takes in terms of supporting educational leadership. You know, the role of principal is about educational leadership and therefore the contribution that a principal brings to a board is that very facet. So you might say, well, if you don't have a principal, you must have a statutory role on the board of someone who provides educational leadership. Now, you know, again, there's nothing to demonstrate or show that the role of a principal being you know, part of a board as it currently is in statute is sort of bad or wrong or doesn't work. So I, I've wondered, we have wondered as a board, why therefore uh, Professor Griggs' recommendation was to go in this particular direction. Again, I suppose I would refer back to the higher education sector and the university court. It would be pretty much unheard of under the code and through custom and practice not to have a vice chancellor present at court. You know, Hence, in the boards that I sit on, the chief executive is always present at that board. So, hence the Edinburgh College position. And the um, ability to attend and address the, um, the, the board would not be sufficient to pick up um, those aspects you talk about in terms of the input the principal would be expected to have on, yeah. on such a board. I, I think, again, Susan's made the point about a level of consistency of practice as well. I think if you are... 
operating as the university sector does under a code which sort of in, in effect therefore through custom and practice has a vice chancellor who is always present because they give that leadership it happens in every university it would be it's the exception rather than the rule that somebody would not be there hence for purposes of consistency um, of educational leadership across regions why not have the person the principal there by by statute rather than by invitation it's certainly true that the, the the new board, the regional planning board at, uh, in, in the northeast, w would see it as almost um, essential that the principal is there. And I don't think it's just good enough that the principal attends. I, I think the principal needs to be part of a board to share their vision, to sign up for their code of conduct, their behaviours, and to go out and model and to articulate that to, to the wider constituency. And I think there's a lot of good practice about the principal being part of that process. And if they were simply to turn up and to answer questions or to provide a report and yet not be part of that whole governance agenda, I think there'd be a dislocation in the vision of the board and how it was actually implemented on the, you know, on the ground. Um, I don't understand why the principal isn't part of the board. I don't have a view, a strong view, about employers. I think I'm sure that boards would deal with that. But clearly, representing a wider context, uh, you, you know, of the, the communities you serve is important to get that balance right. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Can I, uh, I'm rapidly running out of time here, but I want to move on, if I may. Uh, Joan McAlpine had some questions, I think, on uh, sort of quality issues and support for learning. Um, a number of organisations have raised concerns about support for disabled students and uh, in particular the written evidence from Leeds Scotland uh, talks about how the most recent outcome agreements have said very little about disabled students and there are very few targets for disabled students. Is, is that your experience as principals or do you see it changing in the future? From, from our, our college perspective we we treat every student in every application in the, in the same way. So there are no specific targets in an outcome agreement in, in terms of disabled students, but neither do we put up any barriers. And we continue to support um, disabled students who come to the college, and we will continue to do that, Joan. So the, um, there is, there's no change in how we treat um, our, our applications coming in. I think the reference was specifically in relation to higher education outcome agreements and widening access and the statistics from Leeds Scotland in terms of disability and moving forward. But um, there are continued um, financial pressures and constraints in terms of being able to continually support students with complex disab disabilities and learning needs um, on an ongoing basis. Um, what I mean by that is where you have students who are not necessarily pro able to progress or progressing in their learning and not only based on sort of a, you know, a, a criterion referenced approach but also at a learner referenced approach in terms of their learning. And again, I think when we come to the, the discussions around regional outcome agreements with other partners and other bodies, we need to be looking much more coherently with an outcome agreements and with single outcome agreements about how we are best supporting um, so I, I have a deal of sympathy with the, the position of Leeds Scotland um, over this particular issue, but I don't think it's the colleges are able to address that in their own right. I think, again, um, as Carol says, we don't set specific targets in this context, but when we look in, at our role in terms of community planning, we need to look at it in a broader context and be more explicit about it than perhaps we currently are. Do you agree, or do you, is there something else you want to... No, no, I would agree. I mean, there are no specific targets with regard to students with learning difficulties or disabilities within our um, current outcome agreement. However, there are references throughout to disabilities legislation and, and our responsibilities in terms of diversity. I, th I think um, we also have some very specific objectives now, in our newly created strategic plan, they're in the college operational plans as they currently are, about how we will work collectively with partners. Um, we've formed a newly constituted partnership matters agenda group, you know, with the local authorities and others to, to deal with the, the whole issue as fairly and consistently as we can. But I do know that um, th there are concerns 
amongst um, some of our existing students on our towards employability programs and their parents about how we might in the future rationalize that provision now there are no intentions at you know at this point in time it's about local delivery local access um, and you know I, I think it's very important that we we continue to talk and continue to articulate that Susan, did you want to come in? Or? I think it's about, certainly within our college, I've already said we had a fairly high level of um, supported learning within our portfolio, and that has reduced mainly by focusing on providing locally rather than having diverse provision in regions well beyond our own boundaries. I think it is also about focusing on what's the benefit to the student and the partners that we work with in terms of social work departments. You know, if a student can benefit from an educational experience at whatever level, then we will do our best to try and help and support that student where we can make reasonable adjustments for that to actually happen. Uh, and I do think that in terms of part-time students, students, females, and, and learning support students, there has been a reprioritization of the available activity. And it's about how do you manage that sensitively so that you still keep the breadth and aspiration within your curriculum so that it, it is not exclusive uh, in any detrimental form? My understanding was in terms of the outcome agreements, there's a move to have more certif certificated courses, for example, was perhaps damaging some courses for learning disabled students because those, those courses weren't certificated. And has there been a change uh, in the the courses so that they're the more kind of dovetail with the learn the outcome agreements so that they they have certificates at the end or that they're more linked to employability yeah, we've moved, um, significantly to use organizations like asdan for certification yeah. so that you're not actually using criterion reference learning you're le using learner reference learning you're actually able to identify progress in ways different to normal assessment etc um, and from an employability point of view, that's crucial. I think we have been guilty in the past of producing far too many so-called college certificates for pieces of learning, which actually were not recognisable by employers into the future. And over the last four or five years, colleges have moved significantly away from that. So even though, you know, within the discussions around putting learners at the centre, there's clear reference to non-recognised qualifications, they have been reducing dramatically over the years. Um, and that's a very good thing. It's a good thing from the student's point of view. Can I say, it's, from my point, it's about what's appropriate for the student. I mean, non-recognised qualifications in terms of definition isn't particularly clear. Uh, Mandy re made reference there to college certificates. For some students with learning difficulties, those are absolutely appropriate because that is the, the, the highest potential. It's the highest recognition of their potential at that point in their life. So I, I know that the Funding Council is at the moment very helpfully looking at the definition of a recognised qualification. And it's my hope that they won't build their new definition so tightly that what is appropriate for students who have learning support needs uh, is removed from the system. And, and I would agree with that. I think um, we've used a range of certification at whatever appropriate level, and we haven't felt under any pressure to change what it is that we do f for the best interests of the students as a consequence of an outcome agreement. I think that's one of those areas where we reflect that back you know that that's a regional decision based on our experience and we would you know we would resist being driven into an area simply because of some sort of a view that you know that that might be inappropriate you know we we have a view about that and we would say that I'll just just very quickly pick up on what Su susan was was saying um because it kind of struck a chord with me in the sense that some of the um learning disabled organizations that spoke at the cross-party group on learning disabilities suggested that in the past some students had maybe been parked on the same course for years and years at college and they weren't <coughs> making any progress. I'm, I'm getting a sense that you're kind of touching on that in, in your comments. Was that your experience that sometimes that happens? No. Um, my experience, uh, and I've worked in a number of colleges, is that staff work very hard to progress students. It might be slow progression, but they will still progress students. And if you look at the curriculum that my particular college offers, you can see those progression routes where the students can go. 
I think one of the things that has happened in the past, though, that a student will go to a college, a student with a learning difficulty perhaps, goes to a college, works the, their way through that progression route, and then they're not ready to take on uh, employment opportunities, and they then decide they'll go to another college and do something else. And they may go in at a different level, or they may actually repeat some of the work that's been done previously. And it's not an unusual occurrence for me to go into a college and meet someone who was a student at a previous college, and they'll go, hello, Susan. And you think, hmm, I recognize you. And that's, that's what it's been. And I think that is about us making sure that there isn't any disarticulation between that which is available educationally and what is also available for people with learning difficulties in terms of engaging them and giving them something purposeful to do, which might not be within the college sector. And that could well be a really strong positive from the regionalisation agenda, that the transitions both into and out of colleges, into the wider community, are more focused as a consequence of, you know, the relationships that we can build, you know, with others out with our sector. Okay, thank you. Uh, quick question from Neil Finlay. Yeah, it's <coughs> um, links into this. We know that there's been significant cuts in the provision of courses for um, people with learning disabilities. I think the Learning Disability Consortium said 34%. Um, we also know about, you've mentioned the cuts to part-time places, um, and we've also had evidence about how that's impacted on uh, women learners in particular. Can I ask you, uh, the concept of lifelong learning seems to have gone off the agenda. Um, I wonder what your view is on that. We seem to be focusing on a more narrow group. Therefore, there's a whole lot of people who are being excluded or at risk of being further excluded from the, 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 the college uh, setup, which really, in my view, is colleges are about lifelong learning. Okay, can I just run along the panel? Start with Susan, we're along the panel. I think it's about colleges have a responsibility to respond to strategic and policy drivers, but they also have a responsibility to make sure that they deliver for their communities. And I think it's about that balance. One of the good things about being autonomous, independent organisations, as you can see, this is not a good thing. And we can do our best, perhaps, to ameliorate some of the challenges that focusing solely on policy drivers would cause for us. So uh, I do think that uh, we need to take a responsibility to make sure that we actively still engage with those particular student groups. Any other views? Or do you agree? I, I have a great deal of sympathy with what Neil says, and it's why we made a statement in our submission around the focus of age, and we've talked about that previously in the conversation. Um, and again, Liam asked the question, you know, this is a tension between policy and, and bill. And yes, it is a tension, um, but it's recognising where policy currently sits. And as Susan says, it's about enabling and having the autonomy to you know, support as far as possible people who are furthest away from the workforce, not economically active, that's where you want them to, to get them to be, and equally, um, you know, people who are currently in work and want to get that better job as well as having that job. So we have, a, you know, that clear purpose within putting learners at the centre of keeping a job, you know, getting a job, getting a better job. The getting a better job bit is about lifelong learning, and that's not necessarily about an age that you find yourself at. So that, that is an important part of what we do need to do. Thank you. Uh, a final question from Liam MacArthur. Thank you very much, Susan. You talked about the benefits of um, being autonomous, independent uh, organisations. Um, I think we we started out with some of the concerns um, panel members had around the review powers the funding council has in terms of, of course, provision. Um, if there are any other comments, um, please please let us know. But the the, the funding council <coughs> also been given powers to review the number of post-16 further uh, higher education bodies. Um, and the Scottish government have made clear that. It's for colleges to, to restructure that on a voluntary basis, and I believe Paul's indicated a, 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 an example of where that is, has kind of changed over time. But do any of you feel that there may be circumstances in which the funding council may be moved um, to require the, 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 the coming together of, of, of bodies uh, in a way that isn't being sort of done at the, at the present time, or is that, is that inconceivable? Thank you. 
<laughs> that might require the funding council to do something. And sceptical. <laughs> mm, uh, I'm disturbed by your lack of faith. Uh, I, I think uh, it's. Uh, uh, I think. I think it's. Uh, I, I actually said earlier, right, that we always, you know, we all talk about regional coherence and what the regions will be able to do better, right? But nobody has talked about national coherence. And I think that is where you know part of the weakness lies. And if you are saying that as part of this post-16 bill that there will be clarity in terms of how we will make sure there is national coherence as well, then obviously it would take a body to then ensure that that national coherence was implemented. And that may well be, you know, see these three colleges, I think they should be one. Um, but you know, at the moment, I don't think that is anything, I don't think that's even entered our thinking because we are dealing with a very fast pace of change you know, in a difficult funding situation and trying to do the very best for Scotland's learners. I recognise a scenario in which the very strong links in the North East enable sort of fairly seamless transition you know, from colleges to university. For example, we're fortunate and we've built those links over a period of time and the articulation routes that we now have agreed uh, at a contractual level almost work very, very effectively. And, and that's been done as a result of encouragement, building the support, building the, the model. Uh, and I think, you know, I'm, that's a model which I'm sure the Funding Council would be keen and interested in replicating across. And we would like to see that replicated wider across Scotland. To go beyond that, if that was the, the, the number of your question, well, there are very different sense of purposes Certainly, I feel a different sense of purpose in my organisation than I'm sure, you, you know, w w would exist in HE. We, we focus 80% of our activity is on what I would call non-advanced FE. We are very, very close to introducing people to the employability pipeline and getting to the point at which they can get a job. And I would hope that, however or whatever, that that focus, that sense of purpose remains and, and returns and isn't lost. I'm not sure that answers your question. But. <laughs> okay, uh, can I thank uh, all the witnesses very much for coming along this morning. Um, uh, we spent a little bit more time than we intended, but I think that was necessary this morning. Um, it's a very important part uh, of the bill, obviously, um, that, uh, and your views are obviously extremely important um, uh, in our deliberations uh, when it comes to our Stage 1 report. So can I again thank you very much for taking the time this morning to be with us, and can I suspend briefly?
Can I welcome uh, members back to our second panel of witnesses this morning? And can I welcome to the committee uh, Chris Greenshields, Chair Unison Scotland's Further Education Committee, and uh, David Bass, uh, who I believe is Senior Policy and Information Officer uh, at Leeds Scotland. Uh, members will be aware we originally had Penny Brodie, uh, Executive Director for Leeds Scotland, but I believe she's, she's trapped by the weather. She's snowed in. Snowed in. Well, yeah, well, so, <laughs> and sends her apologies. Uh, and unfortunately, Gary Clark, um, uh, Head of Policy and Public Affairs from Scottish Chambers of Commerce, um, has uh, also sent his apologies <coughs> in, uh, this morning. So uh, we are unfortunately are without a representative from the Chambers of Commerce, but I'm sure uh, we'll get on fine with the panel we have. So can I welcome you both gentlemen this morning? Um, you may have heard some of the discussion we had earlier on, but I want to start uh, back at the beginning, if I can, with the governance issues in the bill, and can I ask again Liz Smith to start? Right, thank you very much, convener. Um, I wonder, Mr Greenshields, if I could just ask you, in your submission, uh, you say very clearly uh, that um, you feel that the management and governance bodies do not engage adequately with both staff uh, on, on the day-to-day -day running of institutions or on organisational improvement and development. Uh, it's a very clear uh, statement. I wonder, could you just uh, provide us with the detail of the evidence for making that statement and why you think, obviously, that it has a detrimental impact on the uh, colleges and the way they deliver education? Um, I think um, we, uh, we're, we're doing quite a bit of work on, um, and, uh, on the representation at board level at present, and uh, we've, we've, we've checked quite widely with the, uh, uh, with the members and all of the, all of the colleges. In Scotland, to ask what you know, what the impression was of, of how the kind of staff representation works at colleges, um, and it's clear that um, that there has been you know a real kind of lack of engagement even now, um, when key decisions have been taken in colleges at present. Um, we think there's still a lack of consultation with staff and, and the trade unions. The um, uh, we're still not invited onto kind of partnership boards uh, or shadow boards at present, which are uh, which are operating. And in, in, I said recently, college boards have taken decisions to to merge with really um, very little kind of. Uh, a consultation with, with staff is how we, it's where we feel. Just on the second part of uh, my question, just about how you feel that has a detrimental impact on the way that colleges perform and uh, deliver their education, could you be very specific about um, issues where you feel that a lack of engagement has had problems for a college? Yep, um, we had uh, we've, we've had problems in the past with the disputes, which we've uh, we've had um, problems with. Uh, where trade unions have tried to get to kind of board level to try to resolve those disputes before they um, before they escalated and, uh, and created the problem for our students and for the organisation itself. And um, we found great difficulty in, in doing that. Um, the, the boards historically have taken a position where they leave some of those decisions which they see as um, non-strategic uh, to the kind of senior management. And I think they've been encouraged to do so over, the, um, over a period of time by the senior management. And we think that, that you know, some of the issues that we've seen over the last few years could have been avoided by more engagement with the, the trade unions, um, proper engagement with us. And, and, and do you feel that's uh, true in all colleges across Scotland, or have there been specific colleges where there has uh, been that particular difficulty? Um, there's certainly been specific colleges, but, in, um, but kind of gen generally the feedback that we, that we have from our stewards and, um, and the, kind of wider, the wider colleges is that it's kind of a similar problem throughout. Uh, and may I just finish on the point? Uh, we obviously heard the college principals this morning um, say that they recognise, obviously, that, um, that the uh, process of uh, reform could be uh, very helpful when it comes to regionalisation in terms of setting out uh, more of a strategic uh, aim. But they are concerned about uh, a loss of autonomy to individual colleges. Uh, would you agree with them on that? <clears throat> uh, we broadly kind of welcome the changes in, in, in governance. Um, I think they were well overdue as, as, we, as we put in our evidence. Um, in terms of the, the lack of autonomy uh, for the colleges locally, I, I think you know, for years we have struggled, even um, you know, when we've, we've tried to get um, government um, governmental kind of involvement with some of the issues that, we, that have impacted on colleges, um, we've found that that's been that's not that that, we, that couldn't happen because um, they didn't have any kind of a power of control there. So we can welcome the fact that the, the colleges are a little bit more accountable um, to kind of what the, to kind of wider bodies. Um, the issue that we do have really is still that the, the changes in the that are um, in the legislation still don't address um, some of the kind of representation issues that we still have. Um, in relation to sp specifically the, the multi-college regions and in the staff reps on the regional boards as well. I think what the principals were arguing this morning, when it, the, the, the <clears throat> um, definition of the autonomy they were looking at was how well a college can respond to uh, the needs of, of a local uh, area or the local uh, economy. 
and the concern there, uh, which I presume you would share, um, is something that they're not convinced is, is spelt out sufficiently well within the proposed legislation. Would you agree with that point or not? I think uh, I think in the kind of wider regionalisation issue, um, and, and I'm, I'm not so sure that that's a, that's an issue related to the, the, the governance side that I would see, but I, mean, I do see that the uh, regionalisation may have an impact on um, the ability uh, for the colleges to act locally in the best in, in the best interests of our, its local communities. Yeah. Thank you. Neil Bibby. Um, obviously, there's going to be different structures and different. Um, potential inconsistencies in, in terms of regional strategic uh, bodies in, in one part of Scotland and not in others. Um, in your opinion, what are the, in Unison's opinion, what are the HR challenges of this? Um, I, know, I know what you mentioned, kind of 2P should be enforced. Um, what, what do you see as the kind of challenges in terms of human resources? With the well, well, right now we are, um, we're, we're still currently unclear. I think, um, uh, you know, everyone we speak to seems to be unclear about this in terms of how this is actually going to operate. Um, post regionalisation, um, very little um, idea, especially in the multi college regions, again, about who exactly is, uh, is going to be the employer, how that's going to work, you know, what access we will have to resolve disputes, um, you know, our grievances, anything like that, should they arise, um, and, uh, and that kind of gives us difficulties. Um, so we need urgent clarification while we're kind of careering towards um, this kind of pace of change, which is just going a little bit unchecked. Um, we do need to, kind of, uh, I think, get clarification of that very quickly about what the position will be. Um, that's all just... okay, can I, uh, just for a moment, uh, pursue a couple of these points? You mentioned a moment ago, Chris, uh, in response to Liz, um, that you had concerns um, about the, I think representation was one of them, but you said you had a number of concerns about how the boards I presume both the, you, you meant both in the multi and in the single college regions, or maybe you didn't. But could you maybe expand on that? And what are these further concerns that you wanted to talk about? We don't think that. Well, the plan at the moment is obviously for the, the regional boards under the legislation is that the regional boards have um, two staff representatives. The staff representatives at the moment, with the experience that we find with, uh, with our staff reps, they perform a role. Um, but in general, uh, again, across the, the evidence that we've been gathering in, it's a kind of inconsistent. Um, approach and an inconsistent delivery they have for, for the staff and the colleges, and in some cases it's non-existent um, in terms of communication and, and proper representation for the staff. Um, so we feel that the, the trade union should be involved, they're involved, um, we understand, um, um, in the universities, and we don't understand why that's not being extended to the trade unions and the, and the regional boards and the colleges as well. We feel that trade unions have a kind of structure behind us, we've got a national, um, regional and, uh, uh, and local context that we, we operate in. Um, we've got a kind of wider staff structures um, that, can, that, can embed, that, that can inform us and, and help us uh, uh, do the best job for the staff and the colleges. And, um, and uh, we, we know how to operate in a kind of wider, wider campus structure. We have all that kind of thing in place. We also have um, facility time as well, and we're directly accountable to members. The staff reps, um, we don't feel, um, have that present, and we think it'll be very difficult for them as, as it begins to widen and they, they start to operate in a kind of regional context. In terms of the, the multi... Sorry, can I just stop you there sure. for a second? Um, I, I, you can go on in a moment, but I just want to clarify. Just the issue about membership of boards in terms of staff representation. You, can I, you will understand that um, you know, boards have to have a manageable size, obviously. Um, if it's the case that, um, uh, which I think you presume you're suggesting, that we move to have, if you like, a, a guaranteed place for a trade union representation on the board, which... It, that's correct, that's what you're suggesting. Yes. yes. Are you suggesting it's one place per board, irrespective of the fact that there are a number of different unions involved, or are, are you suggesting one per union? We would suggest one, um, one per union in terms of uh, for the sports staff and for the lecturing staff. Wouldn't that cause some difficulties, the size of the board, if you had a variety of different unions? For two additional representatives? I, I, we don't see that be a, a major issue. Um, you know, we, 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 our, our position is that you know, we could look at that in, in relation to the kind of, there's currently two places for staff reps. What we're saying is that those staff reps, and perhaps we should consider those to be trade union reps. Thank you. Sorry, I interrupted you. Please. That's okay. Um, the, the other area that we've got, uh, we have a problem with is in the kind of multi-college regions, and specifically to do with the um, assigned college boards, um, previously called the local boards. Um, in those areas, again, the, 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 the size of the board, uh, 
is, is, is smaller. Again, and what we have is one staff representative um, for uh, the two different um, sets of staff, and we've no real faith that that's going to work um, for the staff. It's quite a different power um, than, than, the, than that of the staff in the other, the other regional colleges, but a different process of that. And, um, and we feel that that needs to be urgently addressed as well. And we have been doing, and um, the trade unions have been engaging um, with um, a number of chairs in, in the regional colleges to, 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 to ascertain their views on that. And we've had um, encouraging responses in that respect. Sorry, wh why is it a problem? Well, you said it was a problem having one staff rep. Why is that a problem? Because I think um, the, the, the issues for, and clearly the issues that, 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 that may face uh, the two different groups of staff um, after regionalisation, um, they're quite different. And I think the, the, um, the kind of understanding that the, the, the sports staff have and the lecturing staff, staff have, uh, have for their own, um, their own areas, um, really I think there'd be, there'd be a kind of lack of faith that, the, that those reps would work for either side, really. Uh, thank you very much. Um, we're moving on to some of the issues on accountability and autonomy. You'll have heard some of that evidence earlier. Uh, Neil Finlay. Yeah, just to, to both of you, um, uh, reading the, the evidence that we've had so far, there, there, there does appear to be some support for the regionalisation, the principle of regionalisation, but the fear is that it's been undermined by the pace <coughs> and the depth of the cuts. Uh, I'd ask you to comment on that, and I, I suppose in particular, Chris, uh, in terms of giving us a flavour of what is actually happening in the college sector uh, because of the pace and depth, the cuts that are going on, but happily, happily for both of you, respond. Um, yeah, I'm happy to lead off. The um, there's, uh, the present, as we know, the, we've lost over 1,300 jobs in the sector in the last 18 months alone, and um, and we're, we're hearing quotes of obviously 50 million pounds of savings being expected after after the process of regionalisation, and a very rough estimate. Um, you know, we're looking at that. At, you know, a, a salary for to take a salary, for example, of twenty thousand pounds um, per job. Then that's about sixty jobs in every college, and a very rough estimate, as I was saying. Um, and, and, and that's in our previous and the previously existing thirty-seven colleges. But we currently have. I mean, the college that I work in, we currently have about hundred support staff. So we lose, you know, sixty sixty jobs from that college. It'll be carnage in terms of the, the, the support that we provide to our. Um, uh, to our students, and, um, and there's no real, um, we don't see any kind of real understanding or any real plan about um, what kind of service we're thinking about putting in place um, um, for, for after um, after those cuts. Um, the cuts on the ground at the moment, um, are, are, we see that there's an impact on those. We're seeing an, um, an extension of waiting lists for applications for students who are applying, and um, we're seeing queues for funding um, for students, you know, accessing um, required funds. We're seeing staff overworked and doing the jobs of uh, jobs of two. Or more, we're seeing a variation in support services, which is a real issue for us. Is across Scotland, depending on whether a student is studying part time or studying full time, which campus they're studying in, or, or which uh, which college they're studying in, we're seeing a variation in support services. So some colleges will provide a service on um, careers or counselling or a librarian service um, or, or adequate bursary cover, and some colleges won't. And um, they redirect the, redirect those funds, and um, will they will they um, let the let, let staff go? Um, we're seeing more students directed to online services, and we're seeing that's a real impact. Um, it's having a real impact on students. If you look at the problems we had with the Student Awards Agency of Scotland this year, well, lots of students were still waiting for, uh, for funding um, as we approach Christmas. Uh, but it's a huge impact um, on, on a student's ability to progress through their, through their courses. And, and we think that more online services um, uh, and more uh, services which are detached um, from the front line will cause increasing problems for our students. Um, and we note the changes in the, the SDS delivery for um, in Careers Scotland, where, um, where students now, HE students in our colleges, HNC and HND students, are no longer um, have a careers officer who, who will speak to them. They've been directed towards the, um, the, the website. And we don't think that that's adequate um, for, for students. We're, we, we'll, we will see, le we're currently seeing lect you know, lecturers um, being passed more admin work and admissions work and so forth. And, um, and even um, in some cases, we're hearing stu um, stories of students having to jump on public transport. Um, in order to go down to different campuses, in order to get the support they require, um, in some cases funding and so forth to progress their studies. So currently, with the level of cuts we have, um, there's a situation which is um, difficult, to say the least, for our students. And uh, with the, kind of, the level of cuts that we're predicting, another 50 million, um, after regionalisation, with no plan in place about what service delivery um, that the colleges are, are planning to offer thereafter, uh, we just think that will be carnage in terms of support services for our students. I mean, do you have any comment on 
uh, how you see the, the, the cuts impacting? <coughs> I think it's important to differentiate between the regionalisation and the impact of the cuts. I mean, from our perspective, um, it's more the, the cuts and the pace of the cuts have had an impact on, on FE student support um, and opportunities available to particularly older disabled learners. Um, but I think that's something we'll probably get into more later on. Yeah, probably to follow up on that, you know, uh, uh, taken from what you say there, um, do you think the, the, this bill has been uh, pursued in the interests of, you know, educational excellence or um, financial, for financial reasons? I think it would be very beneficial to have a, a more public debate about why the bill is being pursued. Um, what the implications are likely to be like, whether uh, the focus, for instance, on the age group is temporary in response to a recession or if it's something that's going to be a more permanent feature um, of our education sector. Uh, the opportunities for lifelong learning, I think, are a serious issue. Um, in particular, when you look at the education sector as a whole, um, you take into consideration things like the, the CLD sector, is now being funded through the Early Years Intervention Fund with a focus on younger students as opposed to the second chance learners uh, that we more traditionally worked with. Um, issues like the fact that Scotland has a traditionally low level of active labour market policies. And it's going to combine to produce some pretty nasty effects for some of the second chance learners or older learners. Could you elaborate on that? <laughs> sure. Um, the August labour market report showed decreasing employment for the 26 and above age group uh, as opposed to the, the 16 to 24 group that the legislation focuses on. Um, and as the, the college principals alluded to, the economically inactive portion of the population is growing even though unemployment is technically falling. Um, and these are segments of the population that CLD and colleges traditionally would have served. Okay, Chris. Sorry, just for Chris comes in. Can I just clarify yeah, something with David? Um, <clears throat> you said a couple of times there, David, about the bill in relation to its focus on 16 to 24 year olds. The, the bill makes no mention uh, of any focus on 16 to 24 year olds. What the, what the bill does is about post 16 education and introducing um, the ability to create the regional structures, which we've been talking about this morning, and widening ac access, etc. That, that's what the bill's about. I guess I'm talking more about the post 16 reform in general then. So that's which is, which is the 16 to 24 year old concentration of policy on that group is a is a policy rather than it's nothing to do with the bill as such. Yes. Right. Okay. Right. Chris. Um, yeah, we. Um, I think uh, it's, it's clear that uh, you know that there's, there's two things going on. That the colleges are, are, are merging um, quite clearly. Not any, for, for any um, educational rationale, was Unison's belief, um, and, and similarly, they were cutting without any educational rationale. Um, we had Mark Bathel from the Scottish Funding Council talk about um, the potential for merger efficiencies and the savings figures being based on estimates, and that's something that we have a problem with. It that all of these savings that are predicted are based on estimates. Um, we have. I think it was Edinburgh College recently that said that 60% of the jobs that, um, that, that, that they expected to make savings were, um, were going to come from admin, um, and that was to protect learners. So we're not quite sure you know, what, the, what the rationale is behind that, um, protecting learners is to, to reduce 60% of, uh, of the, the job losses that we're doing within the kind of support services, what we would say. And they, and they also mentioned that 8 million of the 9 million pounds of cuts that they were expecting to make in that particular merger were to do with staff, staff cuts. Um, so I'm not sure that the... Uh, um, that the colleges are, are you know, are, 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 are embracing this change for um, for any other reason than um, than to try to kind of uh, to, to, to to address to, to address the cuts that, that's, that's coming their way, um, and that, that's as I said, that's that's the case. We we believe that why why the colleges are merging as well. They've been forced into doing that for being um, for fear of being cut adrift, uh, you know, as a kind of lone body within a, within the region thereafter. So um, I, I think it's a it's a huge impact. In terms of the, the bill and the, 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 the focus on 68 and 19-year-olds, it's obviously through the outcome agreements that that's been facilitated yeah. to put not, that focus not on. The yeah. yeah, but the outcome okay. agreements are Colin, there. Colin, um, I really wanted just a clarification on uh, uh, the part of the written evidence submitted by Unison. There's reference here to shared services and some fairly strong statements given here. I just wanted to check that uh, 
these statements are in fact informed by experience in England and Wales by, by, because I'm looking at the reference to the National Audit Office. So I'm assuming maybe that uh, it, it's not a Scottish experience, it's an England and Wales experience. And, it, and do you have any evidence for experience in Scotland? We, um, we have, um, I think the, the, the evidence that Unison supplied has come from, from, from even wider than Britain. I think that's also been experience of a, um, the information on shared services has come from, from wider field, even in Australia. I, I, I understand the, um, in, in relation to, um, in, in terms of Scotland, we, the, the evidence we have, we need to kind of forward that on. Perhaps we could do that later today, we could pull that together for you. But quite, um, the, the information that was pulled together um, from Unison, from the APSI Association for Public Service Excellence, Unison Scotland, um, document contains quite a lot of that, which we're happy to, to forward on as well. And, um, and they, they concluded that the they, they, um, frontline and backline services were closely interlinked and interdependent on each other, and, and, they, and they needed to remain so. Um, and they often said that to separate was often a design mistake, and it leaves higher paid staff to often do tasks less qualified at a greater cost. Um, so that was the, and they, they used quite a lot of, kind of evidence from a variety of sources, which we'd be happy, as I said, to pass on. John McAlpin. Just a supplementary. I don't know if you had the opportunity to catch our previous evidence session with the college principals, but um, although they, they may have had some uh, qualms in terms of details, I think it, a number of them said that they saw benefits in regionalisation uh, as being able to help them plan better yeah. and reach wider groups. And that doesn't seem to square with, with what, what you seem to be saying here. Um, no, um, I think... Uh, there will be some benefits in taking it and taking a regional approach, and we wouldn't disagree with that. But I think the uh, our issue is that the, the, the whole thrust of this is really is not about um, taking a regional approach. It's about delivering budget cuts, and uh, and we think that's going to have a dramatic effect on on our learners as well as obviously as well as obviously staff in the in the area. Um, we think it'll be driven by um, courses being focused on um, certain areas, and we think that will impact on local delivery. So instead of having you know a variety of courses available locally. Um, which obviously will help improve access and widen access. Um, that won't happen anymore. But those will be just restricted. And I think we need to kind of build in. Um, you know, if we go down this route, we need to build in some sort of guarantees that that won't happen. So do you not accept that in the past there was duplication of courses, and that there may have been courses which were resulting in people leaving colleges and not getting jobs, for example? Um, and that's but that's something that really needs to be addressed by policymakers. I think I think that that's that's true. I think in some in some areas that um, um, we should be delivering courses which um, which have um, kind of possibility where there's an outcome on it. But in terms of duplication, um, th there is duplication, of course. But I, but I think that um, what that ignores is the fact that you know um, sh access arrangements and people who kind of um, want to access local colleges want to study locally. Um, their childcare may be local, and they don't want to travel to you know the south side because you know. At the, or a, a college 20 miles away um, with a current certain um, provision for travel or, or childcare or whatever. Um, they want to study locally and we've got evidence to suggest that. You know, we work in our local communities where you know, it's our, our members and our staff that are out there speaking to people about trying to reduce barriers um, for access to education. And we know that people are intimidated by coming into college and further education, especially those that have been excluded for some time. And, um, and what, what we find is that um, yeah, they might run in a, uh, go, go, you know, go into a college where, where a course might be run in a variety of different areas, but we think that that's necessary. Um, so, you know, in that case, duplication is perfectly acceptable for us. I totally accept what you're saying in terms of, like, you know, access. But you, uh, there, there has been a situation in the past, for example, you know, you may have over-provision of a certain course. For example, beauty therapy, for example. Um, there was a lot of over-provision in beauty therapy. Um, a lot of... Uh, students coming forward wanting to study it and then leaving at the end without any job to go to. Do you think that's responsible for colleges to provide those kind of courses if, you know, if there is an over-provision and there aren't jobs at the end of it? Absolutely not. I think um, we're not saying that there shouldn't be um, c control or a kind, of, a kind of wider approach about what we, what we offer. I think that's in everyone's interest uh, and we want to see that happening. Um, but the issue here is that we don't Necessarily think this piece of legislation, or what's, dri what's driving this piece of legislation, is, 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 is specifically to address that sort of issue. Can I just clarify again? Um, you, you mentioned there about the. You, you seem to think that the, the bill would remove local courses, and, and that the lo that connection between a, 
a local campus and the, uh, and the courses it runs in the local community would be lost somehow. That seemed to be what you were suggesting earlier. But <coughs> Paul Sherrington made it very clear in the, in the last panel that that was their priority to ensure <coughs> that, that was maintained, that that local delivery was maintained. They may be changing, changing the, the names, they may be changing the structure, but the, the local delivery would be maintained. That was his top priority. Um, that's um, uh, so that's it. So, uh, a belief is that you know when when the when when, we, when the level of budget cuts that, that that's on offer at the same time as the as we're going through regionalisation, um, we think that the colleges will make decisions on courses. We're seeing um, already that happen, and we're seeing provision of courses. But um, I, I kind of caught the tail end of the last session. You were, you were referring to kind of part, the kind of drop in part time courses, which we know um, uh, that students who, who who need access to education and. Um, use use those part time courses to try to, to try to kind of get the foothold in, and the kind of uh, the funding kind of education journey. Um, so we think that well, colleges may uh, may say that they'll maintain those courses at present, and we don't have a lot of faith that that will happen. Um, combined with the budget cuts that were that are coming. Thank you, uh, Liam MacArthur. Yeah, yeah, maybe worth just exploring that a little further. We also heard from the last panel about some of the concerns in relation to the review function of the funding council in terms of the way in which provision um, is, is made. So uh, I think um, uh, I mean, Paul Sherrington was, was one who um, I think articulated where their priorities lay, but actually there was, a, um, there was the potential for the funding council to take a view about um, efficient economic provision across a region that may uh, conflict with that. Do you have any sort of observations to make about the, um, the level of um, responsibility and, and uh, influence that the Funding Council has over course provision uh, across the region. How do you see that working? Well, 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 we're, well we're concerned about it um, because I think uh, um, when the Funding Council is in place at present and, and we don't think that they're particularly protecting access arrangements um, for, for students coming to college. We're seeing courses disappearing um, under the radar and in many cases we're seeing um, provision disappearing and, um, and we think that uh, come the end of this year, that when we look at the kind of the figures for um, for students come, we, we know we've seen some of the um, some of the figures recently. But education maintenance allowance figures, for example, um, from most deprived backgrounds and further education, have fallen by more than 12 percent this year. Um, we've seen other other figures in relation to 7 percent drop on, um, on on students from uh, disadvantaged backgrounds accessing HE as well. So, while the funding council are currently in place and, and are not protecting those kind of uh, those areas, then um, then we find it difficult. To believe that they'll, can, they'll be able to do that in a kind of post regionalisation context after the cuts. That, that relationship working? Because, I mean, obviously, there is a significant amount of funding going in from uh, government through the Funding Council to the, to the colleges um, individually or at a regional basis. Uh, and yet, as we heard this morning again, the, the autonomy. Um, the, the, the flexibility for, for um, colleges to respond to the, the, the needs of their areas and regions uh, is seen as absolutely critical. Um, so therefore, how, how do we ensure that the provisions of this bill don't um, imbalance that relationship, if you, if you like, that give a, a degree of accountability, um, but allow the, the, the autonomy and the, respons the responsiveness of, of, of colleges at a regional and a local level to, to be maintained? Um, I, I wouldn't like to speculate about how, how that's going to pan out. Obviously, the, the Regional Outcome Agreement um, is, is designed to, uh, to try to kind of help that process. Um, so, again, um, we don't really have a suggestion in terms of... Uh, and how the funding council will kind of liaise with the colleges or the regions to, to ensure that happens, other than, um, I think, to try to get some sort of guarantees that there, that there will be provision and to make sure that that's kind of um, enshrined in the, uh, I suppose, the regional outcome agreements. If we could take me back to the, some of the governance issues, um, uh, you've talked about staff representation. Obviously, staff student representation is, is reflected uh, in a statutory provision under the, under the bill. Um, but you voiced some opposition to the proposal put forward by a number of colleges and Scotland's colleges about um, the uh, principal being, uh, being a member of the regional college board. Could you perhaps um, explain what your uh, or what Unison's uh, resistance to, to that proposal uh, is based on? 
I think uh, our, our resistance is, is at present, obviously, as, as I've talked about previously, the trade unions um, don't have a presence on the uh, on the regional board. But but more than that, I think we we, we recognise that and um, there has to be some sort of uh, checks and balances and some um, you know some sort of independent uh, uh, check on the kind of uh, how principles operate. And we've seen to our cost um, over the last 20 years that that you know um, may not have may not have worked particularly well. So. Um, in the past, so I think uh, that's that, that's an issue with that. As we think it's healthy and um, it would make sense for for there to be a kind of a, a, quite a, a clear dividing line. Although I mean, I think it was Mandy actually made the, the the point that if you were to look at the university sector, for example, it's inconceivable that vice chancellor would not be a member of the university court, and therefore, uh, why is it that um, universities should uh, have their governance structured so differently in this respect from from colleges? Or would you? Would you envisage a situation where vice chancellors wouldn't be members of the uh, of the university court? I think uh, we, we, we've already said that I think the college sector um, um, and the, the differences with the trade unions involvement in the in, in the uh, uh, and compared to kind of our, our colleagues in the universities is quite is quite different under the legislation. And I think uh, so. We would welcome further further discussion really about that. College of Scotland has also questioned why the, the principle of an assigned college uh, would be appointed by a, a regional board. I mean, is this something that, that Unison's got particularly strong views on? Um, no, no, I don't, don't think so, no. no. I, and in terms of the um, uh, employer representation, again, I think it was Asset Skills had, um, uh, had expressed some concerns about the fact that there was no statutory provision for employer representation on, on the board. I think uh, across the panel um, this morning it was, uh, it, it was, I think, stated that it's inconceivable that a board that was truly reflective of um, the, the, uh, uh, the needs of any region would not have um, that, that, that engagement, that representation, and therefore they didn't see a need for that to be sort of enshrined in, in statute. Would you share that view? Or? I think realistically the, the um um, that, that, that probably happens anyway um, already. So, um, in, in terms of uh, providing a kind of a legislative backup for it, um, I, th I think we, we, we're comfortable with, 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 with so what's there uh, already right, with the, the trade union representation. Um, yeah, can I just ask you, because uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but you, you seem to be saying, that, Chris, that the, the rationale for this is financial rather than for the benefit of the educational outcome of the young people. Is that fair to say? Suspicion, yeah. Well, it's just that, you know, obviously we're taking quite a lot of evidence on this. We took evidence from the Federation of Small Businesses about the the, the current um, mismatch between um, the, 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 the college students in the area and as actually what, what, what jobs and work is available. Um, and I think Joan McAlpine was talking about the, the over provision in certain areas um, without a strategic look as, as what, what's there. And, you know, obviously the government stated it's putting the, the learner at the centre and, and actually being able to look at regional centres of excellence and exploit that expertise across the region, um, which can still be delivered locally, but actually looking at those areas. So, um, to me, I, I, I find it really hard to, to, to see where you're coming from. Um, if I could just, I don't know if you saw all the evidence earlier on, but the, the principal from Cardonald College was making the comparison um, in the market um, competition system that was set up with the, the Conservative government in the 1990s that um, some colleges have been able to become income generating and supporting and everything, and others in that context have failed. Surely if this was just financial, we would just be closing colleges that and performing. Well, I think um, you talked there about um, uh, whether regionalisation would, would, would uh, you know, would, would deliver locally. I think there's ways of delivering that um, without kind of forced mergers, which we, which we've seen and which we are seeing, and that's um, and that to us um, seems to be combined, but I suppose with the with the, 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 the 50 million normally 50 million cuts. Normally we would we would see a kind of a, the, the biggest change in. Um, in education, further education for over 20 years, um, given some time, 
um, and you know, for, for us to properly kind of look at the, the impact of that and how that's going to work and, and, and so on and so forth. And what we, ha we haven't seen that, we've seen colleges have really been forced um, into the kind of merger, merger agenda and they're now going down that route at the same time as, try as trying to kind of deliver, deliver drastic budget cuts without any kind of really long-term plan about how they're going to do that. Um, I, there's, an, there's an understanding that, what, you know, that everyone's going to deliver the cuts and they're saying that, yeah, there's a possibility that that, that can happen and, that, you know, and, and some of the evidence that we've seen submitted and, and, and written seems to suggest there's confidence that those cuts can be delivered, um, but with, without really any understanding of how the college sector is going to look thereafter. So in relation to our issues about regionalisation, I mean, that, that there's, we, we, if, you know, if we were involved in that, we would have said, well, actually, there's ways of delivering um, those kind of improvements and to, to avoid some of the duplication, but we don't accept that duplication is, is, is an issue across the, is across the board with, with, with uh, what we mentioned earlier, the local issues, um, is that that could have been delivered without, without forced mergers. You're using the term forced mergers, but I have, we haven't received any evidence to say that the, from the college principal, certainly in the evidence that's been before us, that it's been forced in mergers, it's been the colleges meeting the challenge of the the post-16 expectations and coming together. Um, but, but the word forced is, you know, very strong in that context. Um, well, uh, I mean, I, that's the, uh, is, I suppose we ask anyone who works on further education like with perhaps people who put that in evidence is that's the feeling on the ground is that um, the colleges have been, those have been reluctant to, 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 to merge in the past. Uh, we're now seeing them, you know, um, speedily um, going into the kind of merger process. Uh, under the regions, and uh, uh, and that's really be, our understanding is that because of a, there's a fear that if they don't, um, they'll be cut out. So um, you know, um, after the uh, um, you know after the, re the, the regional boards come on board and they start to distribute the funding, so um, that's our suspicion about that. You mentioned in your evidence that, that certain courses have actually been been cut, and you, you specifically have um, things like computer animation, digital gaming, greenkeeping, horticulture. When you say cut, have they been cut from one campus or they'd be no longer available across Scotland? We're seeing them, the well, we're seeing them, um, some, of, some of those courses um, disappearing from um, from particular colleges, but I suppose, you know, in terms of local delivery again, um, there's, a, there's the issue that we have with that, is that, you know, if, if we are cutting some of these courses locally, um, it doesn't matter if it's, you know, if it's, uh, if it's still delivered in a, in, a, in a college 50 miles away, it's still going to impact on some of the students who may, who may want to undertake that course. Okay, thank you. I'm going to move on to uh, the issue of equality and support for learning um, and Joan McAlpine. Convener, um, in, in the Leeds Scotland evidence uh, under the widening access to education, you talk about uh, potentially entire populations such as disabled students and carers being ignored. Do you not think that's perhaps going a little bit far? You, you're suggesting that the, these um, these proportion of the population will be cut off entirely from higher education? Uh, it's probably written somewhat dramatically. <laughs> um, but I don't think that means it's not a legitimate concern um, in the way that the access to education is being discussed. In terms of the bill and the outcome agreements, um, in, your, in your evidence you're unhappy with the outcome agreements uh, for 2012 to 2013 because they're not specific enough about disabled students. I think it's, that's fair summation of what you say. But presumably, if the outcome agreements were different, you could actually use the outcome agreements uh, to actually positively help disabled students. It's not the outcome agreements per se, it's perhaps how they've been written in the past. Yeah, I think there's... The issue we were getting at with our evidence was the, the more simplistic way that widening access is being discussed in the bill. Um, I think there's a concern that when you talk about it on that high level, you lose a bit of the complexity um, that, that you actually need to understand the issues and to make a difference. Um, and I think that was reflected in the outcome agreements. And the concern is it might be reflected elsewhere in student support um, and in the wider Scottish government provision. I think the way I think about it is almost it's an issue of supply and demand and the the simple uh, SIMD 20% indicator just increases your demand for students from those areas. Um, I think what you really need are policies and practices that will increase the supply. Um, so a student that's disabled that could go to university 
uh, needs support early on in school. He needs or she needs support at transition. They need their support systems at university or college set up early. Um, they really need Partnership Matters, which is the framework for arranging support to prop fun function properly. Um, and the, the Higher Education and Learner Support Unit, um, the civil servants have been working on Partnership Matters have been transitioned to other areas. I think there's evidence that that focus on the complexity and detail of actually making that progress on the indicator happen are being lost. So that's really what we're getting at. So in what way do you think the bill should be changed in order to deliver what you would like to see it delivering? It's a very good question. Um, I, and I don't have a perfect answer. I wish I did. I think it's a, it's a conversation um, that involves a number of people. In terms of college provision uh, for learning disabled people, um, when I spoke to the college principals um, who were here giving evidence before you, um, they seem to think that, you know, by changing the certification of courses and they, they would, going forward, be able to serve that proportion of the population well and that they were bound by equality legislation to do so? I think the, the responses from the college principals were actually very good um, when they spoke to those issues and I generally support what they say. Um, the thing they hinted at but didn't, didn't quite articulate was that this needs to be discussed in a, a wider conversation. It needs to take in things like SDS and employability issues. Uh, we need to talk about the integration of adult health and social care. We need to talk about CLD provision because the colleges provide a piece of support for disabled learners. Um, but Scotland's made a decision to have inclusive learning, which means there's people with more complex needs who can't get what they need from colleges. And there's students at colleges who progress slowly, and they're not going to be able to be supported for eight years like they previously were. So they're going to need options when they move into the community about how they're going to continue their learning. Um, and it really does get back to this real concept of lifelong learning that I think is missing. Neil Finlay? Yeah. Um, previous, in a previous job working in schools, um, the, the people who knew the pupils the best weren't the headmaster or the teachers. They were very often the support staff who worked with the uh, pupils day in, day out. Um, and I'm, uh, I'm assuming uh, that, that your members, Chris, who are in that position, whether it's support for learning or, or IT support or whatever, whatever, um, get to know the, the pupils, uh, the students, best probably in the college as well. So uh, what kind of impact has the, the cuts um, having on um, groups, for example, uh, disabled students, uh, students with learning disabilities, women uh, and adult learners? Um, you're, you're right. I think uh, most of our members, I know that um, very often we hear the, uh, the term um, back office uh, cuts or back office um, uh, service delivery and um, admin workers and so forth um, bandied around quite a lot, especially when we're talking about um, uh, avoidable uh, or, or cuts, which could be you know in the in the, the college sector. And, um, and and the reality is that that's not the case on the ground. Is that most of our um, most of our staff um, will have a degree of office work, but um, most of them will be front um, front facing as well. There's very actually few who don't have an, an interface or an engagement with, uh, with their students, and that's how it should be, because um, our, our students should inform everything that we do. Um, so the, in terms of the cuts at present, um, it's having a, a huge impact on, on our services, as, as I alluded to earlier, and in, in particular those, uh, uh, those, those groups that you mentioned. We, um, I think our, our members are continuing to try to find um, innovative ways to try to ensure that services um, are, are provided for, for those groups, but, um, but but the reality on the ground is that it's it's those groups who probably who we see more than any of the other groups um, who, uh, who who need the help more who are now being denied that because we're be beginning to find that there's an inevitability about services closing earlier, about services and some and not being offered on some campuses, um, and, and so on, and, and people were being referred to. Uh, as I said, I said earlier, to, to websites and, uh, and and so on and so forth, and we know that that doesn't suit um, every student. Every student is different, and, and it will suit some, but it, but it doesn't um, suit, suit, uh, suit many others, and um, and, and it has a, a huge impact on those students. So practically on the ground, could you give us some examples of, of the services that are being removed and how they impact on people? 
Um, yeah, we're seeing, I mean, I suppose you, we, we see that, um, for example, access to uh, advisors or, 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 or guidance advisors on issues to do with funding, which students need, um, I suppose, it, you know, in a kind of drop-in service on. Uh, we're finding that that's now uh, been restricted to certain certain times, which isn't always suitable for people, especially when we talked about um, young parents there who often have to run off, run off home. So therefore, your financial position isn't um, isn't or, you know organised or put in place um, as early as possible. Um, then you often find that that has an impact and can be a kind of major reason why why students will from will withdraw from from college. Um, so I suppose the the, the the, the closure or the reduction of times that student uh, that um, advisors will, will will access students or, or students can access their advisors, I should say, um, um, is, is limited and is um, is inconsistent again by college by college. I mentioned that earlier that the services that are available um, from college to college is uh, is inconsistent and, um, and it's different. In some cases, we don't we don't supply some services at, at all in some colleges, um, and, and we're finding that now with um, a kind of reduction in the services that we're offering as well now. Thank you. Uh, Claire Adamson. Thank you. Uh, it was just the question asked to the previous panel about the Greeks review, um, specifically in the area of college surpluses. Um, obviously, um, in the current structure, um, there have been quite a few issues with um, <coughs> industrial relations over the years. And it was stated by one of the college principals that one of the, the reasons for the the, the surpluses that they have is is the strategic training and staff development in those areas. Um, in terms of the specific recommendation that the, the surpluses should be limited to 10%, would you generally agree with that? And um, and and do you share the the college principal's view that the the surpluses that are there will, will be used um, strategically to improve pedagogy and staff development? Uh, do I agree that they have been used for that, or they will be? <laughs> uh, Both. Be, we'd, we'd be interested, um, I think, on, uh, on, the, on the figures in terms of uh, how much college budgets and surpluses have been used for um, for staff development. Um, and we, uh, we're, we're obviously, uh, we would encourage more, more of that. And we think that's absolutely crucial. Um, we are, uh, we're concerned about that. I think um, we. Some of the surpluses that the colleges have been have been sitting with, or some of the reserves that the colleges have been sitting with, obviously have been rightly identified in the, the legislation that those should be uh, put back into the pot, and we, and we, we, we agree with that. Um, in terms of the level of surpluses uh, that a college then would have to manage to ensure that staff training took place and so on and so forth, I think is one that we, that we, that we should have further discussion on um, and wider, wider debate about you know, how much that should be and that should actually be perhaps standardised. A follow-up on that. I appreciate we're talking about um, uh, an extent rather than the, the uh, fact that colleges um, should have some form of, of, of surplus uh, or reserve. But one of the arguments that um, the, I think it was Mandy actually uh, was making um, earlier this morning was that in terms of entering the type of uh, longer term contracts with, with staff and providing a degree of security, having that headroom um, within the, the, the finances was absolutely critical. So presumably um, Unison would support a level of working capital that would provide the assurance that allow those, not just the staff training um, and staff development um, work to take place, but, but actually the, 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 the nature of the contracts that um, colleges enter with their, with their staff to be um, underpinned by a degree of certainty and security. Absolutely, I think we wouldn't disagree with that. But I think what, what, what we found here is that there's a kind of wide variation of the level of um, surpluses and reserves that colleges currently have. So that hasn't been happening. That colleges have been keeping reserves and surpluses for um, for different reasons. Um, um, so yeah, we wouldn't disagree with um, working capital. The, the suggestion is that um, it should be around about 10% or limited to 10% um, of its annual revenue. So therefore. I just wonder whether you thought that was a, a sensible suggestion that 10% of annual revenue of a college should be the maximum in, in terms of kept in reserves and anything beyond that should be used for the betterment of the sector as a whole. I, th I think we would we would like to see more um, transparency and analysis of the kind of um, of, the, of the kind of financial figures that we're, we're talking about exactly what that 10% would amount to and what that would mean locally um, and how that how that would work. Um, so. Um, I suppose to, to, to come up with the kind of the percentage, I think we would we would we would need to kind of understand exactly what you know what what was required locally. Thank you. Claire Adamson. Supplementary. Obviously, in your um, written submission, you talk about um, 
you've raised some specific questions about it. Well, one of them is about the, the lack of standard, standard terms and conditions and pay scales in the sector at the moment and, and the variations in that that have built up over um, the, the current structure. Um, is, is it, would you like to see a movement towards standardisation of, of terms and conditions and a, a pay bargaining at a, a, a regional or national level for... Unison's currently consulting its members on, on the issue of national bargaining, um, uh, given the, the, the changes we're going through. Um, and I think it's, uh, it's without kind of prejudging uh, that consultation, I think that's something we would, we, we would be interested in, in pursuing. Without doubt, I think we now have to, to look at the services that are being offered in a kind of national context and say, well, actually, why, it, is it, for the reasons we mentioned earlier, why, why can there be such a variation in pay, but also in service delivery as well, uh, depending on the, uh, which college you go to, or where, whereabouts in Scotland you live, or, you know, uh, or, or even the, health, the financial health of your own college. Um, so we would like to see that addressed, and, uh, uh, you know, and, and, and we're making moves to that end at the moment. Yeah, just one final question. You mentioned in your evidence um, that legal obligations, on, sorry, legal obligations such as TUPI need to be acknowledged in the legislation. Given their legal obligations, why, do they, why does it need to be acknowledged in this legislation? Um, the, the advice that we've had with that is that, the, um, is that we would, it was important to seek um, to have a to consult with a, a view to seek an arrangement um, clause uh, uh, as part of the kind of as part of the legislation, um, and it's something that we would uh, uh, that we would like to seek for um, further development on. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to ascertain why that's necessary, because clearly if it's a legal obligation, then the, the government is legally obliged to, to do it. So what, 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 what advantage is there, if I can put it this way, what advantage is there to acknowledging the legal obligation in the bill? Um, I think it's, a, it, it's for, for, our, for our point of view, that, um, um, is that we've seen that there's, there's issues around the 2P that we, we, we're concerned about, how, how that's been um, dealt with to date. In fact, there's um, Unison's currently dealing with some issues surrounding 2P for staff who are uh, who, who are outsourced in the sector um, about, about addressing that. So it's um, you know it's just to try to ensure that that's going to underpin the legislation. So what what issues are those? Um, issues where uh, um, w without going into the details of that, because some of that is um, uh, is going down a particular legal route that um, uh, I wouldn't want to get expand on. But um, uh, very recent issues in relation to kind of uh, uh, staffing uh, being outsourced and. Uh, and, and how that was handled. Right, I'm, I, I'm slightly puzzled um, th th because this isn't, I'm not seeing the analogy between this, the, the, the issue you're raising and the bill in front of us. This is not about outsourcing staff. No, no, no. Yeah. yeah. We, I, I, I remain puzzled then. Can I comment on yeah. that? Well, certainly. Yeah, just that I, I'm aware, you know, if I speak to, uh, to others, that some people believe that there's no need to put it into the legislation, but others see it as a double lock, if you like, and that was the descriptor that I had. I think if the law, then you don't need a double lock. But anyway, that's, well, I think we've, we've explored that enough. Uh, can I thank the witnesses for uh, coming along this morning? Um, I'm very grateful for you taking the time, uh, particularly David, for stepping in at the last moment uh, due to snow elsewhere. Uh, and can I close the meeting? Thank you.